Hello, and welcome to New World Theater's Juneteenth launch event, in which we are officially launching our newest publication entitled Eight Minutes and 46 Seconds, Fresh Perspectives, a collection of 44 monologues by Black playwrights from 36 cities, 14 states, two countries, all coming together to create one incredible collection. I am Donald Tung, New World Theater's Managing Director, and I'm joined by my good friend, Leland Gant, the co uh, collection curator and also contributing author who is helping to host tonight's event. Now, some of you might be wondering, how did New Hampshire-based theater company publisher in an area that isn't really all that culturally diverse uh, come to produce this collection? And the simple answer is, the tragic murder of George Floyd and the eight minutes and 46 seconds of video taken by Darnella Frazier that captured that horrific event. Like many across the country, we could no longer ignore what sadly happens way too often. And so we declared a statement of action in which we committed ourselves to seek out and actively engage with playwrights of color. And this was our first initiative. We put out a call for submissions for black writers to submit monologues that reflect their personal experience of living while black. And I'll admit that there was some trepidation in our, on our part as to whether we were making some wrong headed move, which is why I reached out to Leland to help navigate us. Understandably, some of the submissions came as a bit of a rebuke saying they were tired of being asked to write about this and we welcomed their frankness and included them in the collection. I have to say that Leland and I were blown away by what we had the privilege to read and consider. This is NWT's fourth published collection. And I have to say that the quality of writing from the pool of submissions was the best we have ever seen. So before we get started, a shameless plug, Again, today we're launching this publication. It's now available to purchase at the reduced price of $9.99. Uh, this is for a limited time. So be sure to order your copy or copies soon. I would also add that all the proceeds from the sale of this collection go to support the authors and a portion will be donated to nonprofit social justice organizations. I've been in discussions with some organizations but we are not able to mention any specific groups as of yet, but stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to put the link to uh, where you can purchase the collection in the uh, YouTube chat so that you can have that there. And I would add that uh, seeds from the sale of this collection go to support the authors and a portion will be donated to nonprofit social justice organizations. I've been in discussions with some organizations, but we are not second. able to mention any specific groups as of yet, but stay tuned. I'm getting the delay. Uh, I'm going to put the link. I'm getting the delay broadcast. So sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So always some little technical difficulties here and there in uh, doing these live live events. So going on. Okay. So. Enough of me. We have a number of authors waiting in the wings uh, who are willing to going to bring out one by one and talk to them about their work. Um, but before we get started, if I could have everyone just turn on their videos so we can just see the marvelous host of, of all everyone who's come to and gathered here tonight with us. It's great. Yay. Wow. Awesome. So glad to have all of you here and uh, looking forward to uh, chatting with all of you. All right. Okay, so turn your cameras off again. <laughs> we'll bring you back. So good to see you. Uh, and I'm gonna start off with uh, Leland because as I said, he is a um, contributing uh, author as well to this collection. And uh, he uh, contributed a piece called, What Are You Going To Do? Um, Leland is a playwright, actor. Uh, he's written a uh, beautiful uh, biographical piece called Rhapsody in Black that I've had the pleasure to see a number of times. Uh, and um, he's also associated with the Actor Studio in New York, I believe, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'd just like to have uh, Leland talk a little bit about uh, his journey uh, in uh, writing this piece. Uh, so take it away, Leland. 
Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, it's good to see so many faces and welcome these people to this uh, this project. It's really been a, a labor of love and it's, it's very exciting to hear all the voices. Um, this particular monologue, what are you going, going to do, uh, came from, the inspiration came from a friend of mine. In my autobiographical play, Rhapsody in Black, I talk about encountering in, in my quest to overcome this racism uh, thing, uh, a group of friends called La Familia. And this person is uh, one of those people. Uh, post George Floyd, he posted something on Facebook saying that, you know, he knew that so much of this was going on. And, you know, he, he, he can't say he can't plead ignorance. But what he did recognize is that he had done nothing. So uh, as a result of that, and George Floyd, uh, I asked the question, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And uh, the piece kind of came out of me whole cloth and, and it was really kind of amazing. <clears throat> so that's really the genesis of it. Um, I'm glad to have a place to, to, to put it, uh, thanks to Donald and this, this idea mm -hmm. of bringing together all these voices uh, to make this statement. Um, that's really what all I can say about it. Okay. Um, I, I have to say, you know, there's, I mean, it's a beautiful piece and we had the pleasure of working together and create a uh, YouTube video of you uh, reading it. And uh, I was able to uh, manage some images to kind of put around it, and, which I think has worked really well. Uh, I've had a number of people tell me how much they've enjoyed it uh, and, and felt, you know, very powerful uh, piece uh, that they uh, enjoyed. Uh, one segment though, you know, uh, you say, and now George, and that sounds like, and that sound like popping bubble wrap you hear is the surprised, terrified jerking of a world full of heads out of a world full of holes. <laughs> and it's just, yeah. it's just such a beautiful imagery of, you know, people just, you know, popping bubble wrap. <laughs> it's just like, but it's kind of, a, it's kind of crazy because, you know, um, it is kind of a willful ignorance uh, and, and it is, you know, sticking your head in the sand so you won't hear anything, see anything, speak anything, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Right. And all of a sudden some event happens and you're shocked. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're surprised that, right. you know, this mm -hmm. is something new. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that image of the bubble wrap popping, is, is, it was just too delicious. Yeah, pass up. You know, people pulling their heads out of apertures. Yeah, yeah. I was able to find an image of uh, of of people like ostriches with their heads in the ground, uh, which uh, matched that you know very well. So if you get a chance, uh, I, again, I posted the uh, link to that uh, YouTube video in the chat. Uh, you can also go to um, New World Theater's uh, YouTube channel uh, where you can find uh, these links and some others of. Uh, of uh, these monologues we were able to uh, record. Uh, so yeah, good, good stuff. All right. I think next we have uh, Karen Magic Fingers Smith, uh, who uh, hails from... <laughs> And uh, actually at the beginning, I was playing a little bit of her, uh, of her music uh, as part of the, uh, just before we got started here. Uh, so, um, hello, Karen. How you doing? Hello, how you doing? I'm doing great. So, you. Uh, you hail from Philadelphia, uh, percussionist, playwright. I'm from New York, but I live in Philly. Okay, so you're, yeah, originally from okay. New York, yeah. now a Philly uh, immigrant since uh, the mid-90s, you say. <laughs> uh, and you're a percussionist, playwright, poet, um, Karen has played with numerous musical artists, poets, storytellers, combos, theater productions. Uh, and also you're a curator of the first LGBTQ Outbeat Jazz Festival in 2014. Uh, so kudos on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, oh, great to have you here. And again, just uh, why don't you kind of start off, uh, you can kind of get us a, a, a bit of a uh, behind the scenes of how unrhythmic Unrhythmic Slave. I love that title. Um, 
you know, I find it, um, you know, unrhythmic, unnatural. Could there be anything more unnatural than a slave? Uh, and uh, so, yeah, just it's Thank a beautiful, you. beautiful poetic uh, title as well as a piece. So, so what inspired you? Um, it was an incident that I, I came across when I was waiting for some food last year uh, around Memorial Day weekend. And um, let me tell you, a lost young queen, she, um, she was caught up in her addiction and um, her movements and uh, her focus was totally off beat, off her, you know, her, her path. And so um, I kind of thought that it was out of my head, but I, it wouldn't go away. And uh, my rest of my day was spending, like thinking about how can I release this into the world? And by that next morning, that's what I came up with, with Unrhythmic Slave. Um, it's, it's really about being lost and, 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 and not being, not loving yourself at all. And not completely have no self-worth. Yeah, the idea of, of, of being cut off at the root, you know, you pull a weed out, you want a weed not to come back, you pull it out by the roots, right? Exactly. And being cut off from our roots, uh, all of that natural rhythm, the, the rhythm in our heartbeat, the rhythm in our walk. I mean, walk down the street sometimes, you see some brother walking down the street, you can almost hear the drums just by the way he's walking down the street, you know, yeah, you can the way he's moving. Yeah. yeah, so the, the yeah, idea of being... Cut off from that, and then again, uh, again, something I work about, I talk about in my piece is, is the the medication that is necessary as a result of trying to deal with being cut off from that, yeah. and what that does to one's psyche. I mean, you, that, it, it's a beautiful piece. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, that's so moving. Yeah. Though I hear drums when I when I present it or or say it, but. I really hear it so offbeat. It's, it's really like um, almost completely out of control, the rhythm of it all. Yet there was still a rhythm to it. Like an asyncopatic a, a syncopatic rhythm or, or, or something just kind of dissonant. Exactly, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where they are now. Yeah, yeah no and, connection whatsoever. Everybody's kind of being past free flow, I guess, even, you know, there's no real connection. And she had no connection. You know? Yeah, the pause so of that. She was disconnected from her own legacy. She didn't know, you know, she didn't know her own legacy. No, no. That's a shame too. I, 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 sometimes I think about Richard Pryor and the things that he would say and, and his, some of his things is uh, uh, talking about the, the talent that is wasted, you know. The sucker could book the numbers sure. didn't need pencil or paper. And now he don't even know who he is. And you're talking about that narcotic. Yeah, exactly. You know? I remember that line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It rings in my head so often. It does. I mean, you said it like, yeah, I remember that line so clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, so, Donna. Thank you for that contribution. Well, the, you know, that's you very much for me. I, I hope things it. are uh, hopefully getting back to normal. I hope you're playing some more and, and getting Oh, out yeah, for sure. Definitely playing. Yeah. Great. That hasn't really completely stopped, you know. Right. Because people have been very creative, so yeah. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, again, thank you for sharing the piece, and uh, wonderful to have it uh, in our collection. Uh, so next up is actually uh, a gentleman who um, isn't able to join us tonight, uh, but uh, has passed along a statement that uh, we can share with everybody. Um, this is. Uh, Michael Hagens. Uh, he's from Astoria, New York. Um, he's had some off-Broadway productions of his play, The Long Rail North, uh, his play, The Basement, uh, as well as The Quest of the Hero. Uh, the name of his monologue is Michael is Black, which is also sort of, I guess, from a longer autobiographical piece about his life. Um, and one segment that uh, struck me uh, in it, uh, he, he writes, the first time I ever realized I was black was in the eighth grade. I remember watching two students fight in the hall of high school. I was confused. Why were they fighting? And I heard the people chanting the N-bomb. I mean, chanting it. So uh, 
yeah, very powerful piece, uh, again, autobiographical. Uh, and Leland is going to uh, do us the honors of uh, reading his statement. So Leland, if you're ready. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Michael's statement. Let me turn the camera. My name is Michael Hagen. Thank you, Donald Tong and the New World Theater for giving me not only myself, but many artists of color a voice that we don't always have. It means so much that our work can be displayed and presented in a format that allows us to express ourselves openly and freely. Michael is Black is only a small piece of a larger work that covers nearly 40 years of both positive and negative experiences. And being able to share this piece with others is the whole point of what we do as artists. And uh, I'm struck by one of the themes that, that, that uh, at the end of his piece, uh, there's a, an equivalency he draws between, you know, religion and politics. So his character is asked what religion he is. His character says ag agnostic. And he says, what, what, what's his politics? And he says, I'm black man. <laughs> so that kind of encapsulates the whole thing, you know. And, and agnostic is black right. man. That's religion that's and right. politics. That's not religion. Uh, uh, unfortunately, but yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. All right, so next uh, up to join us, uh, who's here with us tonight is uh, Christopher, Christopher Buchanan. Um, he's from uh, Forest Hills, New York. Uh, he's a New York City-based playwright, performer, and producer. His play, Ad Nauseam, was recently produced by the New Ambassadors Theater Company. Um, and I would just add that uh, on our website, uh, New World Theater, uh, Dot org. Uh, you can check out all the bios of all these uh, wonderful people, uh, more extended bios. Uh, I'm just kind of hitting highlights here tonight, but I'll uh, also uh, put that in the chat, a uh, link to uh, the page with everyone's uh, bios. And uh, Christopher, yeah, if you can join me, join us here. Thank you for having me. All right. And um, so again, just want to start off with you uh, sharing with us your uh, inspiration behind your piece. Um, and uh, actually, I, I think I, I, your, the name of your piece is Your Grandma Was Out There. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's from a larger work, uh, Angels Watching From Afar. Yeah, that's a full length play I, I wrote a few years back. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so maybe kind of give us some context of where we are in the play. Uh, just, sure. Um, well, what's changed? Nothing. Not in the 500 years we've been in this godforsaken land, and it damn sure won't change because the two of you say so. That was a line that Patricia, the character uttering the monologue, uh, um, speaks to her two uh, granddaughters after she bailed them out of jail from getting arrested at a Black Lives Matter march. Um, Patricia was at, this is part of a uh, the monologue where she reveals her own involvement in the civil rights movement, where she was smack dab in the middle of the uh, 14th Street riots that burned down much of Washington, D.C. after Dr. King was murdered. And um, she was at the um, she was at the, 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 the March in Washington. She saw the famous I Had a Dream speech, and that's when and she was at the age of 23 when she saw it. And she had this, this hope, this yearning for change. And then it was all destroyed five years later when King was murdered. And here we are, you know, nearly five decades later, you know, this was written at a time when Donald Trump was president. We had a white supremacist as the president of the United States of America, a white supremacist. Nothing has changed. All her effort went for naught. And the only thing that she's worried about now is keeping her granddaughters from being killed by police. And I was inspired to write this play because um, quite frankly, the media either glosses over or flat out ignores the, um, the plight that black women in, in our society have with police. And in particular, I was really 
I was really affected by the case of Daniel Holtzclaw, the Oklahoma City cop who was finally convicted of raping 18 different black women over a lengthy period of time. But I'm like, well, how was he allowed to do this? How was he allowed to um, keep all of his dirt underneath the rug, so to speak? How was he allowed to rape all of these black women in the age of social media, in the age of video, in the age of instant news? How was he allowed to get away with this? It's simple. It was swept under the rug, and not just by Oklahoma City Police, but by the American media, too. So that's what inspired me to write this play, Mm -hmm. Uh, because as men, we need to lend our voice in support of women who are facing um, abuse, facing violence by the American police system. Yeah. It also spoke to me, you know, yeah, very... uh, very uh, strong point, but it also struck me as um, the cost of standing up, the cost of, yeah. of, of putting yourself out there, uh, that this grandmother, you know, she says the grandmother was out there uh, and, you know, she knows that, you know, it's the price can be too high uh, for making a stand. Yeah. Uh, I was also kind of reminded of, you know, the, uh, the Tulsa massacre, um, which a lot of people yeah. just didn't talk about, you know. Yeah. And so, like you're talking about these police officer, or this police officer getting away with these, uh, you know, abusing women. Um, <laughs> the whole city of Tulsa got away uh, for years mm-hmm. uh, with massacring a whole segment of their community. Absolutely. Uh, just because people were afraid to, you know, to to speak up and to stand up. So um, that's, you know, that's a, that's a tough lesson, but, uh, and, uh, but yeah, thank you for the piece. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those pieces where you kind of feel, you know, the, what's, what's the, what's the balance here? You know, how do you find, you know, the, the standing up versus putting your life at risk? Uh, and hopefully, you know, it doesn't have to be that, but um yeah, that's yeah. unfortunately something you live with. I think it's also a, a statement of um, the ongoing battle against the futility of it all. You know, not only do we have to face the question of to or not to act, to or not to speak, we have to face the, the Sisyphean idea that whatever we do is going to make any difference. You know, just as you said, it's been a hundred years and what difference has it made? What, what, what has changed? Yeah. And, you know, there, there'll be no end of people, scores of people who, who will point to the incremental change that, I mean, like, you know, yeah. we weren't able to sit at the same counters with you guys before. Now no. we can do that. But exactly. now, as one of the pieces are in this show tonight delineates that just because you let us sit at the table don't mean you're going to serve us on time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, the futility yeah. of things is, is a bugaboo that we, we have to be ever vigilant about, you know, trying to declaw just so we can keep on striving and moving forward. Right. But, you know, damn. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope you're, uh, you're uh, doing well and uh, coming out of the, this whole uh, craziness we've had for this past year and uh, hopefully getting, getting into uh some more uh, live events as opposed to uh, these streaming events that we seem to be stuck in for the past year. <laughs> well, again, thank you for joining us, Christopher. And, thank uh, you for thank you for accepting you. my luck. Yeah, thank you again. All right, take care. All right, next up is um, Shanisha Dodson. And forgive me if I mispronounce your name there. Uh, she's the uh, founder of uh, Black Girls Productions, a public speaker and award-winning playwright. She holds a BA in psychology uh, from German State University in Mass. Uh, and I'm sorry, an MA in counseling from Dallas Baptist University, an education specialist degree from Walden University and a certificate in women's entrepreneurship from Cornell University. Uh, she comes to us from uh, Los Angeles, California. And uh, her monologue is entitled, Tired. Um, which um, is a wonderful piece 
Um, I, I love the, the 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 opening line. Um, being a black woman, I'm sorry, I'm camera <laughs> uh, is a is a, one of God's best gifts. Uh, but um, so anyway, give us a little bit of uh, what what inspired you and. Uh, and uh, all right. Well, hello, everyone. Again, my name is Shanisha Dotson. And what inspired me is just the internal things that Black people deal with when they see someone who looks like them get murdered and then there's no type of justice. It focuses in on the anxiety, um, you know, of just living, existing, and breathing while being a Black person. And so that's why the title of the play is Tired. You know, you're tired of seeing people who look like you get murdered. You're tired of chanting to deaf ears. You're tired of having to fight every time you say Black Lives Matters when people know that's not saying, hey, no one else life matters. So it just focuses in on the anxieties and the different types of things that live rent free in your head, you know, for just existing while being a Black person. So that's, that's, that's how I came about with that play. I was just tired. And so that's what I wrote about. No, it's a beautiful piece. And uh, yeah, Leland, go ahead. Hey, you know, uh, I hear that. And you know, it's, it's also tired of hearing other white folks tell me how tired they are about hearing about my plight, you know. Uh, uh, they get tired. And it's, I, I see this as, as, as the perfect answer to that white grievance, you know. You guys are tired of hearing about it. Well, I'm tired of living it. You know? Absolutely. You, guys, you know, I've come across it every now and then, and you know, it's in my pocket every time I put on a pair of pants. So, mm -hmm. talk about tired. Let's talk about tired. You, you nailed that. I mean, how, how many of us think the same thing and, and get up every morning having to face the day exhausted already? Right. <laughs> Man, yeah. Yeah. Where we are, yeah. You just fell out, Donald. Donald, say something. I don't know if you can you be heard. There we are. Sorry. Do we lose uh, Shanisha? I'm here. Oh, there, oh, there she is. Okay. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of a you know follow up as well. Um, I don't know if you saw that uh, segment that I uh, put in the chat. Uh, just a, uh, a portion of it that I really love, uh, which I guess you've said. Yeah, tired of fighting for our place in this world that only acknowledges us when we are when it's trendy. Black lives matter. All lives matter. Right. Uh, so yeah. And uh, as you said, uh, your fear, my fears are constantly living rent free in my head. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, I, this, this piece kind of came from, you know, right after George Floyd and, you know, all of that. Um, how are you doing a year, a year now? I mean, it's, it's, it's still the same because um, with me, I work in law enforcement. So I can hear the different things that's being said and that doesn't make me feel safer. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in equality. I believe in justice, regardless of what type of position you hold in society, no one is above the law. So it doesn't make me feel any safer. I still feel the exact same way, you know, as I did last year, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, like Leland said, it's, you know, something we just have to, really keep pressing and really keep pushing, you know, and, and hopefully this collection is part of that, you know, that mm -hmm. raising these voices, letting this, uh, this uh, get out there is, uh, is part of that. So again, thank you for sharing your piece. And uh, thank you. That's to you. Thank you. All right. So next with us is Nessa Amherst. Uh, she comes from Silver Springs, Maryland. Uh, originally from Chicago, she is an actress who has worked with companies and organizations from within and outside the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. And her, her piece is 
uh, entitled Define Black. And again, just wanted you to share, you know, where this piece came from, but I just love the, um, the sense of the piece that, you know, there is no monolithic, quote, black experience. You know, <laughs> as I said earlier, you know, we, we kind of ask playwrights to write their monologues from their black experience. And there is, you know, uh, so anyway, share with us, you know, your inspiration and, and where this came from. Wow. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity and to be surrounded by such talented writers and artists is an honor for me. This piece actually came from a memory back in high school where my best friend and I were hanging out at the mall and we were enjoying each other's company. And um, we, we were walking past a group of students from our high school and they were whispering as we were passing by. And somehow my best friend got word that those people said that we dressed like white people. <laughs> um, it, just, it just stuck with me for so many years. It's like, is there supposed to be a specific way um, black people are supposed to dress? I, I don't think that's quite how it goes. It's sort of the same with each race I don't think there's supposed to be a specific way of dress that you should wear. There's no specific way of how to act. There's no specific way of being what we see mm -hmm. as Black. I mean, and a big part of that monologue that I wrote was much of that was seen stereotypically in movies, TV, and music. And it's just heartbreaking that rather than celebrating what makes each person unique in their community, they automatically think, oh, let's make the Black person uh, a thug or a drug addict or mm -hmm. something stereotypical just so we can get bucks. And it's like, no, that, that needs to stop. I, I am sorry, I, I am literally sick and tired of black people, Latino people, Chinese people, all of the minorities being seen in a certain way that is degrading and humiliating to yeah. us. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. gotta stop. Yeah, yeah I saw a piece on, uh, I think it was Facebook uh, where there was some sort of thing going around where without sort of any dialogue, showing a scene, a, a horror, quote, a horror scene, mm -hmm. you know, and one of them was a young blonde female woman in a car and a black man comes up next to the car. And that's all it was. And the idea was, you know, how horrifying, you know, I, I was like, you gotta be, kidding me no i mean can anything be more blatantly racist and stereotypical you know and this is where you know we talk about systemic racism that's what systemic racism is you know just these deep-seated uh ideas that uh is in our society that uh yeah it just needs a huge purging uh, there's something to be said i'm sorry go ahead no no that's okay no, go ahead I would, I would also like to add, um, recently I saw In the Heights with uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda and John Chu directing, and I love the movie very much, but unfortunately in the days afterwards, there was this heated conversation about Afro-Latinos being seen more in the background as opposed to the prominent roles. And it's just sad that in this day and age, a movie that is supposed to celebrate a community that um, has been sort of stereotypical, stereo stereotyped, let me say, as mm -hmm. things for money. This problem still exists, unfortunately, that it has to take movies where it may seem wonderful, but not 100% perfect in order for us to say, we need to do better. We need to do more. 
to make sure that each race needs to be seen in a positive and uplifting way and not in the same stereotypical way. It, it, it seems to me all too often, I mean, even in um, our own communities, <clears throat> we are shunted into, you know, stereotypes. Um, a guy named Torre, he, he was a talking head on MSNBC, uh, wrote a book, Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness, and it talks about in that book how even in the black community, you know, we say to people in our community that we are, you're not allowed to do that because that's not what black people do. Mm -hmm. Torrey was gonna jump out of a helicopter, you know, as a parachuter, he says, uh, uh, uh. black people don't do that, Torrey. You know, so uh, we have been infected by the same inhibitions uh, that we have been bathed in through the white gaze and has infected us and it has stained us. So now we are behaving in that same way uh, in our own mindset, how we think of ourselves, look at ourselves, how we look at our, our other people in our community, you know, because why can't we celebrate the fact that, you know, I love, uh, now I, I'm gonna say some stereotypical things here, but it, it, it's to illustrate that there are differences and that there are iconic things that are wonderful and that, you know, are generated by various and sundry cultures that need to be celebrated and, 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 and embraced as opposed to saying, well, you can't do this and you can't do that because this is only that and this is only this. And it's like, hmm, hmm, yeah, yeah. It's an ongoing process, an ongoing battle, but just like everything else, silence is not an option. <laughs> no. Thank no. you very much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I actually wrote a blog entitled Silence Isn't Golden because it's these, these things that are still happening today, even after 400 plus years. Right. It's like, this, this has got to stop right now. I don't, I don't know how many more times we need to say it. Mm -hmm. Silence equals um, the problem. And right. silence is the problem. And we have to speak out about this. Yeah, most definitely. Well, thank you so much uh, again for sharing your piece and being part of this and joining us tonight. Happy Juneteenth. My pleasure, same to you. All right, uh, do we have, um, let's see, uh, Gary Earl Ross with us tonight? I don't see him in our list of participants, but I may have missed him. Gary, are you out there? Okay. Uh, hopefully he'll join us later. Gary, if you're wow. watching, uh, join us. In, join. Uh, well, I want to. I, I'm sorry, he's not here. I want to talk about this piece. This, this piece. Yeah, um, Gary's uh, piece is entitled. Um, it's a wonderful title. A walk. Walk a Mile in My Rage. Uh, Gary is a retired University of Buffalo professor and author of numerous books and plays, also the winner of numerous awards, including the Edgar Award for Mystery Writers of America and three Emanuel Freed Outstanding New Play Awards, just to name a few. Uh, and again, uh, the name of the piece is Walk a Mile in My Rage, uh, which uh, we uh, did as part of a reading last fall and uh, as I recall, he said that uh, it's pretty autobiographical uh, of his growing up experience. Uh, so, and Leland, what do you, you want to? I mean, it, it, it's just, um, see, I, I wrote another piece that uh, it, it, was, it was entitled The Fire This Time, question mark, written on Jimmy Baldwin's piece. And I mentioned it in, in the foreword. And it, it was about that, that rage that is all consuming, that, that volcanic uh, 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 pyre of fire uh, that we walk around attempting to, to curtail and, 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 and control and find ways to challenge, you know? And it, 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 when we talk about what he said, the day that we realize as a, a culture, as, uh, as a group that what we long for and strive for is forever out of reach and never to be attained, what then is the circumstance? What is 
what are the recompense, what are the ramifications and repercussions of discovering the validity and the solidity of that fact. And it's got to be a paroxysm of violence here for, heretofore unseen. And he says, we're going to burn it all down. Now, right. we know that there are factions, uh, mm -hmm. Proud Boys and, and, and uh, Oath Keepers and a myriad other uh, white supremacist organizations, white nationalist organizations that are more interested in burning the country down if they can't have it their way. We are mm -hmm. trying to pull hard in the other direction for the most part. But mm -hmm. what happens when we decide that, well, hey, they might have a point. Why yeah. don't we just start from scratch? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a question. Yeah. I don't, yeah the, I'm not saying I have an answer, but it's, yeah, the, it's a question. The lines Leland is referring to, I, I put it here. Um, he, he, uh, Gary wrote, so your anger becomes rage. But even in rage, you know that you and others like you still believe in the American dream. The day you all stop, the day all the marginalized believe there is no place in the country for darker skinned and other differences, that bigotry is beyond redemption, is the day America burns to the ground. And uh, I remember working with him last fall as, you know, with, and the actor and um, talking about that. And, and I said, and he agreed, that it's not a threat. He's not, it, it's not a threat. It's Two plus two equals four. You know, it's, you know, the day this happens, you know, it's, it's physics, you know, it's, you know, it's um, so, you know, and, and like we we're just talking with um, Nessa, you know, about her piece in how, you know, if we can't overcome these things of even systemic racism uh, within even within entertainment, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, that we have to, uh, you know, we have to really be open-eyed about all this. Uh, so that's yeah. Yeah, a great, a great piece. Uh, and thank you, Gary, uh, for sharing it. Uh, so uh, moving on, we have so many people here tonight, just wanted to touch on all these great works and their writers. Um, Next one is also not able to join us tonight. Uh, Gladys Maturi uh, is, um, left us a statement about her piece, A Gathering of Old Men, uh, which is about an older man who's 60s. And again, I mean, I'm talking about Gary's piece, you know, the walk a mile in my rage. This is a sort of dramatically portraying this individual who is just living this at age 60 with all the things that have happened. And that, in, and now another uh, tragic event has happened and he's just come to the point of, you know, just boiling over. Uh, so it's, it's a really powerful piece. Uh, Gladys's uh, statement she is sharing with us. Hello everyone, my name is Gladys Maturi. I am 25 years old. I'm an actress, a writer, a filmmaker, and mother of a beautiful boy. I started writing in my junior year of high school. I was writing for an essay competition and won the competition. I've adapted and completed two plays, White Mama and Gathering of Old Men. I am currently working on one act play, Boys Like Us. I've always had a passion for being a writer. I love to write because it helps me express myself and express stories that come from my mind or a dream I had. I appreciate this opportunity and wish I could join. Unfortunately, I am currently grieving right now. My good friend recently passed away and I'm sorry. I hope you all understand, certainly. Thank you so much. It's nice to meet you all and happy Juneteenth. So thank you, Gladys, and uh, have your thoughts for you in, uh, in this moment with uh, your uh, friend passing. So, and hope you're doing well. Uh, next up is Cashel Campbell. I know, yeah, Cashel is with us. There she is. Uh, and I'm getting the name right, Cashel? Cash like money, Cash L. Cash L. Cash, Cash. Okay, you got it. <laughs> All right, so uh, Cashel comes from uh, New York City. 
uh, a native New Yorker, uh, began her artistic endeavors successfully as a child actor, uh, SAG and uh, AFTRA, uh, established in 1987. Wow. Alongside her pursuits, she has become a dancer, performance artist, uh, theater and dance expression, and in 2016 achieved a Master's of Science in the Creative Arts Therapy field as a dance movement psychotherapist from Pratt Institute. So welcome, Michelle. Uh, and uh, her, her piece is entitled Hashtag the Black Girl. Um, and I love that, you know, some of them these pieces obviously um, have kind of focused on uh, not only the black experience, but the black female experience and, and what that is like uh, and sharing that and getting that voice out there. Uh, so please share with us a little bit of uh, what, what your inspirations are and uh, what brought you to this piece. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this as so many others have stated before um, writing is something that has really um, been a place where I can find my truth and some solace at the same time. And I think that um, when I started in the business of television and commercials as a small child, I was really aware that what I looked like um, was less desired than what I could do or what my personality brought mm -hmm. and that other uh, children that were around me that were lighter complected or uh, their hair wasn't didn't take as long to comb uh, were sought after even if their talent was less than mine. I think I was about five or six and that I, it really landed for me oh, yeah. that that was a part of my reality. And when I wrote this piece, I think that I was very sad and very vulnerable and very um, okay with those emotions, but not necessarily finding places in the world where that could be validated for me. And this piece is really an ode to my own self-compassion um, for understanding the sense of loneliness and emptiness and sadness um, that can go along with being abused because racism is abuse. Mm -hmm. And it has so many different uh, touch points and expressions. Um, the piece provided me a sense of self-validation. It provided me a space for my own pain to be a spoken out of my mouth, to be written down on paper. And something interesting that happened today as a dancer, of course, I had to record this piece and dance to it. And I did so and posted it on YouTube. So I'll share the link if anybody wants to hear yeah. it, see it in motion. Mm -hmm. But as I was reading it today, I realized that I, I have a typo in there. It should say Sarah Bartman, not Sandra Bartman. And I immediately felt so small, so sunken because I know who Sarah Bartman is. But then I realized when I was writing and I think back to the time and I think back to how new it is for me as this black woman in America to have space to speak about my experience that in those moments I am vulnerable, I'm nervous, mm -hmm. I make mistakes and I'm fragile. And so that's reflected in the work itself. Mm -hmm. Lastly, this piece is my own sense of self inspiration and self love to say that although the parts of me that are a part of so many other black women and black girls um, that are celebrated, but really enacted as envy through hate, that I can celebrate those things and create art with them and celebrate me and celebrating me is celebrating her and celebrating she. Beautifully, beautifully said, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, the, uh, the, uh, one piece, part of the piece that uh, struck out to me uh, when you wrote, um, this pain isn't new. I don't matter. My voice doesn't matter. My love is ignorable. My existence is a dream. I would have come and gone and no one would have seen me or heard me. And, you know, one thing that struck me is, you know, the, the title of the piece I found whimsical, hashtag the black girl. And so it kind of it kind of set me up for something. I wouldn't say lighthearted, but not punching, which is what this piece is. And so it's kind of a it is very strong, and it obviously comes from the heart. Uh, and, and well, you know, thank thank you for sharing that. You know, because that's that's not easy uh, to, to bring out something so personal and so beautiful. Uh, that's uh, great. I think there's, there's, there's themes that you talk about in there that are, are resonant 
not only for black women, but as we see uh, Asian women and it becomes a fabric of our society because it's a, it's a product of the white gay, you know, black women are sexualized, you know, fetishized, mm-hmm. right? Uh, 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 everything but personalized and accepted, you know, uh, just not even put on pedestals, just put in closets with, you know, break glass for youth. It's, 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 it's it, I just, I, I just keep coming back to the same thing. These things have got to be talked about and, and, and put out there because all too often it is swept under the rug. It is ignored. And, you know, I, I'm out here telling the story of a, a, of a black man dealing with things. And I get the question, well, what's the difference between what you experience and what black women experience? And I have to say, well, uh, black women seem to have a double whammy, you know, they're dealing with everything I'm dealing with. It's, it's like Ginger Rogers talking about her and, and Fred Astaire. I'm doing everything he's doing, but I'm doing it in heels and going backwards. You know, so it's like <laughs> there's a lot more layers that, that have to be looked at and considered and, 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 you know, speak. I mean, my brother said it earlier, uh, stories about what black women experience in this continuum, uh, Sandra Bland, you know, have to be, you know, cataloged and, and put out here in the world. And you've done so, so eloquently and so passionately and so completely, I have to say, you know, that, you know, you covered all the bases, darling. That's yeah. a powerful ass piece. It's a powerful piece. Thank, yeah. thank you so much. If I could just say one more thing. Um, when, I, when I also think of a lot of the sourcing of that pain, it has come from my own experience with Black men who I love so much. And I think that um, in our stereo, stereotypical expression that we get to experience here in America as Black people, it doesn't allow for us to have the authenticity of who we are. And authentically, I'm a sensitive black woman. And I wanna be with a a sensitive black man who can embrace that. And in my experiences in the past, it has been a source of me being punished instead of celebrated. And I think the piece wanted me to talk about that. If anyone gets a chance to visit the virtual performance that I did, I am exposing my body and my shape and my skin and my curves. And I wanna do that in my joy um, because God gave it to me and I love it. And lastly, The hashtag piece, you know, I'm so exhausted with how many of us have become hashtags. Mm. And I think that that title was really about, in so many ways, we see the names and we say their names, but we see nothing at the same time. It could just say hashtag the boy or Mm. hashtag the girl. Mm. And and that also encapsulates a lot of uh, the feeling that was there. So thank you both so much. I appreciate it. Thank Thank you. The minimalization the minimalization, you know, hashtag just makes it so common and it's not beneath our notice because it's like right Christmas, right? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Well, hey, and I have to say that, uh, you know, in, in Leland's piece, he talks about how, you know, his piece is to kind of start a conversation. And, and this is what, you know, I'm, I'm loving about this, you know, this event here we're doing tonight is that, you know, we're just really having great conversations about uh, important stuff uh, that uh, needs to be talked about. So again, thank you and take care. So uh, next joining us is, um, we have Jonathan Benjamin uh, from Arlington, Virginia. And uh, Jonathan, are you uh, with us here? I just wanna make sure, there he is. Hey, how, how you doing, Jonathan? Good to see you. Um, he uh, is a US, Air Force veteran. Uh, His play, American Airman, was honored at the Kennedy Center's American College Theater Festival in January 2018. And uh, Jonathan's piece is entitled, How Dare You? Uh, And this is one of those pieces that I mentioned in my intro uh, where it it felt like a bit of a rebuke. Uh, And he he writes uh, in the piece, why must I start a conversation with my being Black? Why is it always a matter of race with me? Uh, So Jonathan, uh, again, thank you for sharing this piece and I'd love to hear uh, again your inspirations behind it. Well, thank you. I appreciate all the opportunity that you provided me and the other playwrights. I I really am grateful for this opportunity. Um, You're welcome. 
So I'm a wounded veteran. I, let's say 2016, I was given the opportunity to uh, partake in social recreation therapy is what they call it. The Wounded Warrior Project put me into a recreational therapy program where I would be working with the therapist who literally all he, his job was to do is to get me into the social activity kind of thing of life. After my accident, I had to learn how to acclimate to social life and society, really. I had to learn how to have fun again. And he was there to help me to figure those things out. And one day in 2016, around the Oscars and that year in particular, the Oscars were in some heat for having not given any nominations to people of color. There were no nominations for people of color. And right. So it was on the new, we were, we were at a bar. Oh, we were at a bar. It's okay. It was, it was with my therapist. I was, I was fine. But, um, we were at a bar and it was on the news and he turns to me while I'm stuffing my face with the shepherd's pie, mind you, I'm just enjoying myself. Right. He turns to me and he asks me the question, why is it that every conversation with African-Americans has to go back to race? Why isn't it just we're people? Why does it have to be about your being black? Why do you have to really hate that? At the time, I was P-I-ist. I had no idea how to answer that question without being every stereotype. You probably thought that I would be in, in reaction to something that wouldn't make me upset. I had no way to productively respond to that question and it sat with me for years. Hmm. So that was 2016. We got our call for submissions last year. Right. Um, I'd been sitting with it for a while. And after George Floyd was killed, I it it lit a spark. Why this is why. This is why we have to restate that we're African American. This is why we have to state, you know, to let you know that we know who we are, that we deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. And you will have, a, you, you will have, uh, ooh, excuse me. Yeah. It's, it's a piece that I sat on for a while and something that needed to be said, it was stuck on my heart and in my mind for a very long time. And I needed to, to get out after George Floyd, I just knew. This, this needed to be said and I again thank you for the opportunity that yeah, thank you drive to do it so it, it sounds like maybe I, I misread then that this wasn't a how dare you or I or New World Theater to ask mm -hmm. you to write about your experience uh, it's more of I guess from that experience in 2016 you you know, having that question posed to you and feeling like, yeah, we need to talk about this. We need to make this forward. So, well, yeah, well done. Um, Jonathan, um, man, um, your passion and your, your, I hate to say it, pain, uh, uh, that you've been sitting on this for, for so long uh, and I'm glad that this has this forum has given you an opportunity to let some of that off, like you know, like a pressure cooker, to mm -hmm. be able to have some place to put it. Yes. Because you know, <clears throat> that's that's what I was talking about on the forward to the piece. Because you know that that has it's either going to destroy ourselves, it's going to destroy something outside of us. We have to find some way to channel it to make you know a productive contribution. You know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I got you right out of the box, you know. How dare you? How dare you ask me why it's always about race? Why is it always about race with you? 
I can't be seen as I walk into the door. First thing you see is a black man say black man, not man. You see black man. So then it's all about you trying to convince me that you didn't see that. <laughs> you know, you're going to ask me why it's all about race. How I, and I have to be here and not say and not be me because I want you to be happy. So I, you know, your white fragility and your guilt is more important than me expressing my truth. I mean, I, we go 24, 7, 3, 6, 5, you know what I mean? And it's, man, it, it, it said, said, cosign, stick a flag in that. I mean, I, I'm just so impressed with your voices, all of you guys' voices and, and the, the passion and the truth that you bring. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Jonathan, because, you know, as therapeutic as it might have been, I also understand how hard it was to do that shit. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I, I just add that, yeah, in Leland's foreword, he talks about the, uh, the rage he was sitting with and and how to deal with that and um, and then just writing, you know, and writing. And um, th there is a, um, a therapeutic effect of writing, you know, to get this out here. But hopefully then it can also be lifted up and, and uh, put out to the world so that's heard uh, as well. So uh, I'm glad to be a part of that. And um, thank you and best wishes and to you and, uh, and your recovery and, uh, and all that uh, you're, you're working through. All right. Have a happy Juneteenth. Thank you. Happy Juneteenth. All right. So next up is uh, JJ Tingling, uh, Jessica uh, from Norristown, Pennsylvania. And uh, she with it, there she is, great. And uh, she describes herself as the epitome of the information professional, the author, the publisher, the librarian, the archivist, the recorder and witness. Her writings are meant to connect spirit across time and space to reach a deeper understanding of ourselves and all that is around us in the, in the day. And her piece is called When It Rains. Uh, and I've actually asked her to read it. I think it's one, I think it's probably the shortest uh, piece in her collection, um, but it just has this profound, simple beauty to it uh, that I just, uh, yeah, ask you to share it with us and we can talk about it. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Um, the piece is called When It Rains. Our ancestors are in the rain. With each drop, they cover us in their love, blessings, forgiveness, hope, and redemption. To cleanse, to nourish, hydration to the core, to renew and replenish. They remind us we are not weak, we are worn. To fight another day, we must heal and reevaluate. The moment we decide to continue, we have no longer failed, but merely stumbled. Prepare. There is growth after rain. Drink your honey, ginger, lemon, apple cider, vinegar, tea, and prepare. Growth is coming. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd have to say it's it's one of the more hopeful pieces in the collection, and you know that's not to you know denigrate other things, you know, because obviously things have to be brought up and things need to be voiced. Um, but I just love the the um, the sense of moving forward and and growth, uh, and hopefully we can you know move forward uh, out of you know a lot of the things we're dealing with. So again, I uh, ask you to kind of give us a bit of a background to your piece and, and talk about that. Yes, absolutely. Um, with this piece, I, I wanted to capture that there are people that transition, that leave us, um, but they're not gone. They're still very much with us. They're still guiding us. Um, they're still walking with us. And when it rains, 
um, I'm telling you, I, I feel them around me and I know that they are still at work. And when we are down and we're frustrated, they're still here um, to remind us that take, take your breather, catch your breath. Um, and tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to get to work mm-hmm. because there's still more to do. Beautiful. Yeah. And I really uh, enjoy the imagery there. Yeah, the image of, of rain so often, you know, rainy day, you know, oh, where's the sun? You know, <laughs> right. it's such a pejorative image, but when you think about rain as, you know, like mana from heaven, like uh, the ancestors uh, replenishing you, you know, bathing you in, in, in this support and hope, you know, and say, yeah, you got this. Because we got you. I mean, mm-hmm. we're the shoulders you're standing on. We're the foundation you'll never leave. You'll never lose. I mean, it was so beautiful, man. And, and to drink your honey ginger has yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> I just want to say, oh, yeah. <laughs> I need me a cup of that in my damn self. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> yeah, it's so beautiful, darling. Thank you. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for joining us and, and uh, happy Juneteenth. All right. So the, uh, I have uh, Melda ba- Beatty uh, is not able to join us tonight. Uh, she comes from Chicago, Illinois, uh, is a playwright, author, and assistant professor born in Jackson, Mississippi. She now resides in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, with her three gifted and beautiful daughters. Her play, Front Porch Society, delves into the complex and connected lives of four elderly Black li- women living in the Mississippi Delta on the eve of the 2008 presidential election. Uh, the name of her monologue is November 4th, 1967. And uh, she's given us a statement here that uh, Leland is going to read for us. So Leland, whenever you're ready. Yeah, um, November 4, 1967, is taken from my stage play, Front Porch Society. The play and monologue are set in 2008, when America elected its first Black president. However, the mother's grief faded space and fight for justice 41 years later, after her son's murder at the hands of police still echo today. I wanted to juxtapose a historical and joyous event with a historical and traumatic event for the black people in America with the hope of healing. I I just, I just love this piece. Um, It 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 talks about the hopelessness and you know when 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 Barack got elected, all of a sudden we were like. If we were post-racist society, <laughs> all of a sudden uh, racism was over. I mean, we, we've got a black president. How could there still be racism? Uh, come on, you guys. Uh, and we have since discovered that, you know, it, all it did was unleash the worms that were residing deep in the apple. So uh, it, 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 it's a rough rough road to hoe attempting to what uh, metabolize the apparent uh, disinterest and the repetitive nature of, of history where we can't seem to get out of this positive feedback loop for a negative result. Uh, it is so heartfelt and it's a damn shame, but Again, the plank in the platform. Right. It's the it's it's the the reaction uh, of those that feel as though they are losing something, uh, uh, and you know who knows uh, what 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 they I mean they feel a threat. You know I mean they they genuinely feel threatened and it's, it's unrational. Um, and yeah, I don't understand it, uh, certainly. Um, but um, yeah, 
So yeah, it's a, as you said, a powerful piece. I, I think it towards the, I think it's at the very end of the piece. I, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, the one woman says, excuse me if I don't dance a jig just because we elected a black president. Uh, yeah. You know, it's that, that sense of, yeah, we've been here before. Um, right. So. And with all that hope and, and all that, you know, jubilation, and mm -hmm. it's, it's good that we had the moment because again, that reinforces the possibility of the reality of the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if we got this far this time, we could, you know, it's a good yardstick or barometer about how far we can get and uh, go beyond right. that. That's not just uh, elect a black president, <laughs> have the election of a black president actually mean something. Something, right, yeah. <laughs> Instead of just, you know, a blip on the radar scope of have a, a history. Mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't turn into that ultimately, but uh, right now it's really looking poorly. Really looking poorly. Yeah, I think I think we're we're at a very uh, definitely a tipping point, uh, and the next few years are going to be very um, you know telling. As to yeah, where we're that was the word was in my head telling. Yeah, right. absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Melda, for that piece. And uh, we been, appreciate uh, having the opportunity to share it. Next up uh, with us tonight is, um, let's see here. I believe we have Kim Mullins. Are you with us, Kim? There she is. I am. Hi, Hi how, are you doing? how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. No, oh, thank you for, for joining us and again, sharing your piece with us. Um, excuse me, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with my screens right now, but uh, once I get caught up here, uh, we will continue. Oh, let's see here. So um, not sure what's happening here. The internet is always such a an interesting place at times. <laughs> you want me to pick it up, man? I can pick it up till you get caught up. Uh, I think I've got it here. All right, great. Uh, yeah. well, maybe I do need you to jump in here, Leland. If you All right. Okay, go ahead. This is Kimberly E. Mullins, Black by Popular Man. She's from Newberry, Florida. Her bio is a poet who was retired from the Navy, that's dope, and currently works as a Navy Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps, NJROTC instructor in Gainesville, Florida. She graduated from National University with an MBA in finance and University of Central Florida with a major in marketing. Her first poetry piece, My One Last Scent, was published in a literary journal, Amistad, in 2007 at Howard University. In addition to writing poetry, Kimberly has done spoken word venues in Urban Grind, Atlanta, Georgia, Bus Boys and Poets in Washington, D.C., and the Thomas Center in Gainesville, Florida. Yes. So, Kimberly, the inspiration behind this piece, Black by Popular Demand, what were you thinking? How did you get here? And what is it you wanted to say to us? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for this opportunity, um, Leland and Donald. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, the piece was actually inspired. I actually started um, working into or doing theater. Uh, and I was working on a script when uh, my um, mentor was telling me about this particular monologue um, contest. And the title 846 I actually I thought we were writing about that time that time period until I you know read the requirements again and it was inspired just by the last incident with the George Floyd you know here we were we're locked up in COVID and everything seemed to be peaceful everybody's trying to be safe and that picture comes across the screen with the policeman with um, his knee on his neck and I just couldn't for the life of me get that image out of my head and what I saw when I saw the image of the police officer was his lack of concern for people of color, his lack of humanity. And it just brought back um, memories that I had forgotten about of 
things that happen for me when I um I see from a young age when I grew up um, that I experienced and when I was in the military uh, up to this point, you know, things that I totally forgotten about. So but when I, it actually, the title of the piece was the last thing I came up with. I was actually thinking about, you know, the things that were happening in the last few months. And then I thought about back by a popular man and I was trying to spin it. And I was like black by unpopular man because black people aren't unpopular at the time and at the time at now and in the past we we are not are we in, in the past we are not what society wants to see so i thought the title was fitting in black by unpopular demand i and i personally love the play on words there you know taking a, a phrase that we are all familiar with back by popular demand and and changing it to something totally, basically opposite of what we typically think of the phrase, which is, yeah. You know, um, I think a number of the pieces have done that. Um, the uh, walk a mile in my rage, and so walk a mile in my rage, you know, so, um, and it's just a familiar thing to, to take something familiar and which connects with people and then kind of use it to, to make a, an even, uh, either an opposite point or uh, even a uh, more poignant point. So it's, it's great. Uh, I asked you to read something. I don't know if you got that in the chat. Uh, it's just a segment that uh, kind of struck me. Okay, I can read that. Yeah. From, my, from my mere existence at the young age of grade school, I was told by another girl my same age that my skin always looked dirty, yet hers was clean, lily white it seems. When does racism start? Apparently it's taught very young. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is so true. Man, um, kids, how many times have you seen them playing on the playground or in a sandbox? And they're just kids, mm -hmm. you know, they get infected and then grow up to infect other people. I mean, I love this piece. It was, it was like <clears throat> living while black, period. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just period. Breathing while black, shopping while black, walking down the street while black, you know, uh, being while black is, is something you have to hold your breath for, wait for the other shoe to drop constantly. And I've been debating on whether I should say this, and it's true, but these pieces bring it out to me, out of me, I guess. As a black man, my wife, I'm married to a white woman of Italian, Irish descent. And, you know, we live in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And I'll be on the corner at Prospect Park West, which is a large avenue running beside the west edge of Prospect Park. And we'll be standing on the corner at an intersection, and I'll hug her and grab her and kiss her on her neck, bury my head into her neck and her collarbone. And 15, 20 seconds go by and I'm thinking, I wonder if this is gonna be it. I'm waiting for the sound of the gunshot that blows my brains out. Mm. I'm waiting for the sound of the shot that shoots me for daring to love my white wife in public. Mm. This is the psyche of a black man living in America. Right. These are the thought processes that go through the head of me. If it goes through my head, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's ever thought about this. Right. So this, this ever-present fear in whatever vibration it is, 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 is in, mm -hmm. you know, this is what you're talking about. This is what we face every day. You know, I feel it. I get you. And I just hope it opens some people's eyes, you know. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's a story that needs to just keep being told and, and keep being, you know, pushed out there. Because I think, you know, it's, there aren't enough places where we'll be able to hear these stories, you know, these stories that we're typically uh, given are just um, whitewashed, you know, <laughs> to put it frankly, uh, we, we, we live in uh, the whitewashed story world. Um, 
in the in the latter part of your piece, you talk about uh, being stopped by an officer and and just the, the physical, as, as Leland was saying, you know, standing on a corner, just wondering, you know, when's the shot going to happen? You know, just wondering when that something's going to happen to you. Um, just is not an experience that I have. And I just, I just want to share something that, you know, definitely is a story of white privilege. Uh, I was coming home late from a rehearsal one night and I was stopped by a police officer uh, for speeding. And uh, as he was, you know, exchanging the papers and whatnot. And he asked, you know, what are you doing? Said, oh, I'm coming home from rehearsal. And uh, hey, would you like a, a brochure? It had some postcards in the back. And so I leaned into the back of the car, totally out of sight, you know, to grab a postcard to give to him and then hand to him. And I hand it in and, and he's perfectly fine. But if my skin were black, I'm sure he would have been much more in fear himself just because of you know what our society is as as is you're saying at a young age uh is just kind of uh, taught and taught to us so um so yeah so, again, go ahead it's so true and it's so true especially with the um, traffic stops i'm still um on edge when I'm stopped by a cop for whatever reason, I make sure I have my wallet nearby so I don't have to do too much movement and it shouldn't be that way. Right. You know, that's right. the society we still live in. Right, right. Well, again, thank you so much for sharing that and, and giving us that uh, beautiful piece. I, I, want, I want to say one, one thing, mm -hmm. uh, and this is for both Kim and Cacho. Uh, your accessories are killing me, man. Those glasses are bomb <laughs> they are the bomb and cash if you lose that hat you know who got it <laughs> thank you so much thank you that let me be a you're part of looking, this you're all looking great tonight thank you thank you all right uh next up is alva rogers uh also from new york city uh, her writing utilizes magic realism to explore identity and the, and the uses of enchantment. Her new play, Roman and Julia, uh, was commissioned by Monta, uh, Montalvo, I'm sorry if I get that wrong, Montalvo Arts Center in 2019. She has received a Master's of Fine Arts degree in playwriting from Boston University and MFA. Army? Oh, Brown University. I'm sorry. <laughs> near Boston, I see Boston, <laughs> from Brown University, an MFA in musical theater writing from NYU's Tisch School of, of Arts, and a Master of Arts in Teaching History from Bard College. Um, she appears in the films School Days and Daughters of the Dust. And uh, thank you for joining us, Alva, thank you. Uh, her piece is entitled Reconstructing Whiteness. Um, and again, I just love some of these titles. Are, the, the titles are just some really great, um, make you think. Uh, and you know, reconstructing whiteness, what is that all about? Uh, so please share with us uh, where, where this came from. Well, um, well, thank you so much. And I'd like to congratulate all the other authors this evening. And I'm grateful that we're all here in community on the evening of Juneteenth. Well, uh, this uh, monologue is from a one-act play that I actually wrote um, a li little over 20 years ago. And the title of the play is called The Life Before Reconstruction, Reconstructing Whiteness. And just um, coincident coincidentally, or I should say uh, due to the synchronistic forces, uh, the play itself is going to be uh, featured in the Women's Fringe Theater Festival on July 17th and July 18th um, uh, this year. And well, so uh, I just thought I would um, mention that, but to get to the, 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 the origin story of this piece, of the monologue, the origin story is this. Um, one evening uh, when my daughter was about three, three and a half, um, she came to me and she said, you know, mom, I want to write a poem. Get a piece of paper, please, and a pen. 
and write these words down. So I said, okay. So she, she said, um, the first poem is called The Life, or The Life Before. The Life is the first one. And then it just began, I'll just read a few lines. Suddenly the rain begins to appear, and suddenly she wipes the rain from her eyes, and the baby poops on her face, and she runs and runs to get home to meet her father and baby. And then it went on, and then she said, okay, I have another one. It's called The Life Before. And here it is. Water appears, then the rain drops, then the candy falls, and drops into her mouth. They all mix into the same color. And then, this is the end of my life story. So, you know, we did bedtime story, then it was good night. And around the next week, I was listening to um, NPR, and there was an interview with David Duke. Um, and he was lamenting. Uh, the data that has been that he had been reading that was saying that the, at, during the next millennia, people of color will outnumber white people, and he and his um, his colleagues or tribe they have been they have been discussing and trying to figure out you know what what they could do to prevent this from happening. And so I thought it was just so interesting because my daughter was, her, her poems were these meditations on just the fear of, in the first one, the fear of losing one's parents. And then the second, the second, um, the life, the mixing of all peoples, mixing into all, into one color. So I thought, my gosh, this is so interesting how my daughter's poem and, and David Duke's uh, fears are sort of, they're, they're meeting on some kind of plane, you know? Um, so then I thought, well, what would he do? What could they do? And so they, and I thought, oh, well, they will, of course they'll try to reconstruct whiteness, but how would they try to do that? Oh, well, perhaps through separating the races physically. I mean, it's sort, of, it's sort of apartheid. But but not just separating the, the races, but also just making them live, making all people of color live underground without the sun or moon, no moon or stars to dream upon, no sun to keep them warm. And so in, in, in my story, all people of color lived in the the country, the United States was divided into quadrants. And, and, and the quadrants, you had your Asian peoples and your brown peoples, black brown people. And, and all white people lived above. And, the, and there were different, there was a different sort of economy then. And so all the, the work to, to maintain the life for the white people, people without color, was done underground. Um, farming and such and so forth. And so, and books were banned. And so the mother, so I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, let me slow down here. Um, the, so in this world, the pregnancies of, peop of women of color are monitored. And because they want to make sure that they're all going to have what's called a pure offspring. And if the offspring is not pure brown or pure whatever race you are, then mother and child are eliminated in the elimination chamber. So uh, the protagonist in this story, Una, she's visited by her mother in her dreams. And they monitor the dreams of, of, the, um, of the women of color. And the mother breaks through Una's dreams and tells her about the life during the previous reconstruction. 
and, and she tells her about the previous reconstruction, the one that happened in the United States after the Civil War between 1865 and 1877. And then she said, you know, and so then, um, a few hundred years later, a division was made. And so another reconstruction, the second reconstruction began. And, um, and she said, and books were banned. And so, um, and so the story is also about the keeper of stories and the importance of passing the story and history down to, to our, from ancestor to, um, you know, direct descendant. And so in the story, you have the mother tells her daughter, and then the daughter tells an Asian woman who's, an Asian woman who's pregnant, she tells her the story. And um, so yeah, so that that's, that's the kind of, point of the story. Yeah. Definitely magical realism, as you say. The, uh, uh, and it's, it's beautiful in the sense that it's really about um, I mean, your, your story of, you know, listening to David Duke on NPR, which is like, why do, why, why, why do you even interview people like that? Anyway, uh, <laughs> in the first place, um, but it's, it's controlling the narrative. You know, what is the narrative? Um, and that is definitely why uh, you have to lift voices like these um, because on May 25th, 2020, uh, Derek Chauvin thought he was controlling the narrative. Uh, he looked into those people's eyes and had no worries that what he told happened was just going to be the narrative of that, that night's events. Um, and again, thank God for Darnella Frazier, who had her cell phone there and recorded it. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be here, <laughs> you know, uh, if it wasn't for her. Um, and that eight minutes and 46 seconds that she recorded. Um, and so again, your piece is about, you know, how do, how do white people somehow reconstruct their whiteness and control the narrative uh, to make it seem like uh, everything's okay, you know, no, no problems here. Let me see. Well, thank you so much, Alma, for, for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. Neilan, do you have a... So, uh, just, just uh, uh, you say you wrote this is from a piece you wrote what twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, it's prescient. Yeah. Because uh, uh, Donald du uh, David Du talking about it then. I mean, it's on everybody's mind now. That's what yeah. that's what's at, the, at the core of all of this: the diminishing supremacy of the white race. If it's if for no other reason than numbers, and you know it's been a numbers game for so long. So that's mm -hmm. why the minority is trying to choke the hell out of the, the majority. Uh, right now, and for you to write something like that again, out of the mouths of babes, man. I mean, uh, what, what, where's that little girl at now? <laughs> and what is she writing now? <laughs> is she writing in there, yeah. <laughs> I mean, cause, I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah, she's still writing. She's Good. Still Good. Good. I look forward to hearing her voice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes, baby, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next up we have Antonio David Lyons. Uh, is from uh, Los Angeles, California. Uh, but uh, he hails from uh, South Africa as well. His artistic universe straddles the globe with one foot planted firmly in South Africa and the USA. His creative spirit enjoys the balance of performing in front of the camera and nurturing meaningful projects through the production process. Holds a MA in Applied Theater from the City University of New York, a Fulbright awardee and Oregon Shakespeare Festival producing fellow and a scholar in residence at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, 
He is the creator of We Are Here, a social activism campaign born in South Africa that utilizes discursive play to engage men and boys in themes of identity, masculinity, relationships, gender-based violence, and HIV and AIDS. Now, welcome, David. Uh, his piece is entitled Firestorm, uh, which I think uh, comes from his country of, you know, sort of origins in South Africa uh, experience there. Uh, so yeah, please, David, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Antonio, share with us uh, now. Hi, how you doing? Good. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for having me um, and being among so many amazing creative souls uh, and have an opportunity to have this conversation. So just, just to clarify a few things, I'm born and raised in the U.S. My family's from Jamaica and the Bahamas. Uh, South Africa is a country I immigrated to. It's my second home now. Uh, I immigrated there in 2003, and I was there for about 13 years. And so now I'm back and forth between South Africa and the U.S. This play uh, that I wrote, We Are Here, uh, then grew into a social activism campaign. Firestorm is a monologue from that play. Uh, the play is now about 10 years old. The play was um, a, a moment for me to really try to engage with some issues around uh, gender-based violence, um, particularly writing from the perspective of male bodies um, who often are silent in that space or uh, are problematic. <laughs> uh, and um, this is an opening monologue from that work. And in that monologue, I was really trying to grapple with you know, my identity as a, as a Black man um, in relationship to uh, Black women, to Black culture, um, to structural racism. Um, and the work was a painful thing to just kind of realize this this, this system that we're trapped in um, from birth, where your body, your skin color um, will be attacked and abused and life taken. Um, and often we, we sit in these places where we're de desensitized around some of the violence. And I think that's the thing that made um, witnessing what happened to George Floyd and Sandra Bland and um, so many horrific murders that have happened, uh, particularly over the past couple of years, um, a turning point because all of a sudden people couldn't be as desensitized as we have been to what's been happening to us. And we kind of we push it down and we wonder if this thing is really a thing that's happening by this structure. Um, and so it felt like a moment of, I can't be silent anymore. Um, and while this firestorm is swirling around us is a kind of line from the monologue, which kind of epitomizes what uh, the impetus for writing it was for me um, to really try to, to grapple with that, that hurt, that pain uh, that's real and relevant, uh, that, that lives in all of us, whether we realize it or not, um, and, and often can't name it. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you finally they will put name, a name to it to, to voice it. Um, and while the piece is about 10 years old, witnessing what happened to George Floyd uh, just broke me down. And I went back and I read this piece. Hmm. And it was a whole new <laughs> revelation, you know, that happened with it. So that's, right. that's the journey. And so I had to submit it. And I was like, this speaks so to this moment. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, much of our work as artists is prophetic um, because spirit speaks to us the stories that we need to tell, the things that others need to hear, that we need to use to heal or activate whatever we need to do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. yeah it's, it's a beautiful piece. It's, I, I was just reading over it again today and you know, it's just so poetic in its, in its, in its expression. Uh, I mean, it's sorrowful, it's, but it's, it has a, such a beautiful poetic structure to it that uh, I just, I'd love. Um, okay. one, one sentence that struck me is, you wrote, I won't be silent anymore as a firestorm swirls around me. 
an inferno seeking to consume my soul and my identity, my manhood, the fuel feeding the flames as they rage out of control. The fire brigade stands with arms folded as timbers of my soul turn to ash. Um, and again, it just, you can just feel it. You know, it's just, just a, a very strong, powerful piece. And um, I think, as I, as I said in my opening, that, you know, the, the submissions we got were just so incredible. Um, and I think it really is, speaks to how much of it comes to such a personal space uh, mm. for all these writers like yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Thank the you. idea that they, 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 they won't listen to us unless we scream. You know, I, I felt that maybe <laughs> Firestorm was, and maybe I got it wrong, but, you know, there's a certain amount of validity as a, as a protest statement. You know, with all, 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 everyone else attempting to control our bodies and to control our narrative. It's a pretty strong statement. I'm thinking about, you know, these, these monks that sit down and set themselves on fire. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's what hit me, that this brother set himself on fire, that I'm gonna be in control of my narrative. I'm gonna do what I need to do to make my statement. You know, and the, the fact you talk about they, 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 they won't hear it. <laughs> they, won't list, they won't hear this unless we scream. But when we scream, they won't listen to it. Mm-hmm. Can't <laughs> hear know. it. But can't, right. can't hear it. Can't. Right. It's, so, you I know. Mean, that, mm-hmm. no, yeah, it goes back to Leland's piece about talking about, you know, the head stuck in the ground and, you know, like ostriches. Uh, but I think it's, 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 there is that relationship. It is the silencing of oneself. Mm-hmm. That is the power of white supremacist structure in the United States Mm -hmm. that will teach you to silence yourself. It will teach you to self-harm and self-hate. And you don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't, it it won't reveal itself until you are out of the geographical cultural landscape to see who you are in it and who you are outside of it. Mm And not many of us get that gift. And it's a privilege when we do. Yeah. You know, well, and Leland, you're absolutely correct. You know, the layers within this monologue are that he does set himself on fire in a particular kind of way. There has to be that explosion, that disruption that shakes loose this, this, this perverse normality for him <laughs> to fight for his life, to fight for those he loves, to fight for a place in the world that is unapologetically black mm-hmm. 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 and human, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and that's you know, and that's why I open with this this monologue in the work, you know, because that's we got to start there. Yeah, we can't even begin <laughs> to have a conversation as men about the ways in which we destroy, minimize um, Black women's bodies and other women's bodies um, until we face our own truths and our own demons and the root of it all, right? We got to break it all the way down. And so that's, you know, that for me, that's the core of the work. That's the core of a a lot of my work, Um, whether I'm in, in front of the camera or in theater or writing or doing workshops or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think that's the core of the work period, man. The work of being a human being is to go into you and figure you out and, and, and <laughs> find all you are and, and, and love that and then bring that to the fore because that's, 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 the <laughs> that's the labor, right? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what we're called to do. That's what James Baldwin speaks about, right? That's where all our elders speak about, even our grandmothers. You got to do right. the work. And you're, wor- you're, and you're worthy of the work and the fruit. <laughs> you know, like you are, you are worthy and you don't do it by yourself. No, can't, can't. You know, that's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, my bro. Thank you, it's tap you now. powerful. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna tap you now. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, Liz Morgan up next uh, and she's uh, <laughs> asked you to read her statement. Um, and I, I sent you her statement, didn't I? 
You did. Liz did. is a, a dear <laughs> friend you. and a phenomenal creature yeah. in this yeah. world. She is a force of nature. <laughs> uh, I have to say that, yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with her uh, last fall and uh, presenting her piece, um, which is in the collection. Why mm -hmm. I was late today and will always be late as a Black woman. Uh, she's a playwright, poet, and performer. Our, her written work has appeared in the Huffington Post and the Long Island City One Act Festival Anthology and the Medium Publication, and Athena, Athena Talks. Uh, and I'm going to just put the, uh, the link to the YouTube that uh, we uh, have uh, created with her. Uh, she performed last fall for us. And uh, Antonio, when you're ready, uh, take it away. Absolutely. Well, I was late today and will probably always be late as a black woman is a true story from my life. I first published it on my Facebook page moments after the events described in the piece, not knowing if it was a poem or a monologue or that it would be shared around the country and become the work for which I am best known. This piece was first and foremost a way for me to process my own trauma but I hope it has brought some awareness to the complex reality that many Black women face, even in movements that we begin and lead, our rights end up ignored, sacrificed for the bigger cause. I know too many Black women who have felt forced to choose between suffering domestic violence and witnessing state violence. We deserve better. The time for transformative justice is now. The words of Ms. Morgan. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah, you're welcome. And, uh, best to you and uh, enjoy your enjoy your rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So we are uh, continuing on here. I think you know, probably running a little longer than we had hoped, but we're having great discussions here. So I, uh, for all those uh, waiting in the wings. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, next up is Lewis Johnson uh, from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, just make sure uh, Lewis is with us. All right, great. Hi, Lewis. How you doing tonight? Good. Uh, in June, four, uh, June of 14, his play, The Lepers of Orchard Park, was produced in the Fade to Black Play Festival in Houston, Texas. His play, Papa, was produced in the Stage Black Play Festival in New York City and Dallas, Texas. His work has been broadly produced in places like Louisville, Kentucky, Phoenix, Arizona, and Nashville, Tennessee, to name a few. And again, I just ask you to you know, go to newworldtheater.org and uh, check out all the bios of uh, all these wonderful writers who we've uh, been able to engage with here. Uh, Lewis's piece is called The Voice Inside My Head. Um, don't we all know that? Uh, uh, voices can multiply, it seems like sometimes, but uh, look forward to sharing, sharing with us uh, the, uh, the inspiration behind your work. Well, you know, it's, it, there's been a, a huge spate of police killings lately. And uh, after George Floyd got murdered, I uh, wonder what it, would be like those last few minutes of his life when you knew, you know, you know someone's getting ready to take your life. And, and most of the pieces about how the people who filmed it stood around and watched and didn't try to save the guy's life, you know, how why they didn't get, intervene to try to help him. And it's just, uh, I feel they, I, I feel they have blood on their hands as well. Right, the um, silence is uh, complicit, complicity, you know, being complicit in the act. Um, yeah, the piece is uh, sort of, as you say, uh, a voice um, from beyond the grave of, of somebody who has uh, suffered uh, at the hands of police, as we've you know, too often seen. Um, was there any particular situation or that uh, struck you in, in writing this? No, not really. I just, you know, it was just all the stuff I was seeing on TV. And, you know, every time I leave the house, every time this happens, and it happens quite often, 
every time I leave the house, uh, if I'm gone, if, if I go to Kroger to get groceries, if I'm gone longer than it, it's the time it should take, my wife calls me, you know, and she's panicked because every time I leave the house, I may not make it home. Yeah. You know, I could be pulled over and shot and killed just like this guy. He was out on the morning run, mind his own business, and he wound up dead. And it, it, it's not so much as fear for myself, but it's her constant fear for me when I'm out in public, not yeah. knowing what could happen. You know, that's the stress of living while black. Right. That at any given moment, Shit, this could happen to you. This could happen to anyone. So that's why I wrote it. Yeah, I, I thought it was really, really, really tremendously deep, Lou, uh, to, 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 to come at it from the inside of that experience. And, you know, it's pretty much a blow by blow of, of a sanctioned murder, you know, and, and I don't, I don't have to live it. I, I've already lived it through your piece because it, it's just the way it has happened so often. It, it's, it's almost like a template. And, and, and your, your, your character, all he did was slow down for a second and that was enough. The guy was looking for something. He was trying to provoke something so he, he could bag one, you know. And, you know, I spoke about my fears about the, hearing the bullet, but we're all a twitch away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, I mean, we're all a twitch away. Yeah. As a black man, and I know you can relate to this, as a black man, you're out and you're walking, you're alone, and you see a police car, if he goes past you, you automatically go into reactionary mode. It's automatic. It's not, it, it, it's inherent. It's a black thing because yeah. we know. If he slows down just a little bit, the shit's getting ready to go down. So yeah. you got to be prepared. You know, that I wonder what he's go uh, is he going to fuck with me? You know, and just to be straight, you know, it's, you know, and then you, you tense all up and, you know, your whole night is ruined. Right. For your whole moment. night is ruined. Think the factor. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's a real thing. It, it, it can be really hard to navigate. But I'm I'm so glad that we're sharing this, man. Yeah. Where are you at? Where you where, where are you at? I'm in Nashville now, but okay. Most of my years I've spent in Boston. I was gonna say. So that's how I found out about these there. guys. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I hate the Patriots. I don't even care. <laughs> I don't even care that my brother's quarterback. I hate the Patriots. I mean, nothing against you, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a free shirt, you know. One yeah. they gave it to me. Free shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Where with pride, Daddy? Where just, with pride? Yeah. <laughs> I would just add the one thing that uh, struck me in this is uh, again the voice beyond the grave, uh, being able to tell its side of the story. Um, boy, you know, if Trayvon Martin or Tamir Rice or Emmett Tillman could tell us what had, you know, what what they could tell us. You know, that George Zimmerman, uh, you know, what the hell was he doing? You know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the, so, yeah, this is, this is it, it, it throws the perspective around and tells it, you know, gives us it. There is another there is another side of the story, but we're never given the chance to hear it because the people who can tell us it are dead. And nobody really thinks about that <laughs> or at least, you know, it doesn't doesn't break into the consciousness again thank you lou and uh enjoy your evening you thanks for peace yep yep uh next up on the dog is diana mucci from burr ridge illinois uh she's a afro latino author playwright poet prof professional you saw me? i didn't watch it no. oh, okay it was inspired by her multi-ethnic family to share stories out loud that could draw no. laughter from a crowd. You know, I don't, I don't. Hello, how you doing tonight? 
Uh, Diane has performed as an actress and has written, published, and or produced short stories, children's books, poems, TV commercials, indie films, and in 2005, her first play, I Am a Female, Seeking a Male, was, uh, which earned accolades from the Chicago Sun-Times. So welcome, Diana. Uh, great to see you. Uh, her the title of her monologue is Spit, um, and I'll let her tell where that comes from. Uh, Thanks Diana. for having me. Um, thank you, John and uh, Leland and the rest of you brilliant writers. Really, it's an honor to be here celebrating this launch on this, you know, really special day. Um, so I wrote Spit so long ago. If I tell you how long it is, then it's just going to age me. But it was 15 years ago or over 15 years ago. And it's the first story of my uh, memoir, Growing Up With Big Hair. Um, and it's about an Afro-Latina who moves into an all-white neighborhood and experiences racism for the first time. Um, so a little background, my parents are immigrants. My dad is from Haiti. My mom is from Puerto Rico. And when I was 12, we grew up in this neighborhood that was very multiracial and it was really easy to, you know, nobody even, you know, with blacks, whites, Latinos, like we had every, every race and nationality in the neighborhood I grew up with until my parents, when I was 12, decided to cross over this like invisible demarcation line uh, where all of a sudden we enter into an all white neighborhood. And um, we were the first brown family to move in. And, you know, of course we were kids and I don't even think my parents understood what that really meant. And on the first day of school, this, the story spit um, kind of retells the story of um, on our first day of school, we were so excited to be in this neighborhood and we saw a bunch of boys in the corner and um, we thought they were, you know, going to welcome us. And they basically did with um, racial slurs and spit. And so there's the, the title, um, you know, so I experienced that my sisters too, I think primarily because I was older, my sister and my older sister and I, um, you know, I felt ashamed. I, the teacher assumed that I didn't speak English. She put me in a remedial reading group. You know, I, I was ashamed of my skin color, um, my dark hair, my curly hair, my brown eyes. I mean, everything about me, I thought I started to question and I wrote, you know, the story and I tell my stories, I realize as an adult, like, I want to share these stories with other young people, with other people that might have the same experience or that are going through the same thing, right? That, you know, it took me years to accept myself, accept my multiracial heritage. Um, and I just, I just want to tell the stories to get, you know, the kids to understand that no matter what the experience, racism, discrimination, marginalization, like, you know, what I did, you know, what I experienced in schools that... Um, nobody has the power to dictate to you, to them, to these young people, um, who they are, right? There's no one person, there's not going to be a teacher, a community, a society, or a piece of paper, you know, um, that can give you that sense of self and that pride, and that's got to come from within. And, you know, I'm hoping to inspire kids as they read my stories and this one in particular. So that's... It struck me as, uh, you know, and it's striking me with a number of the pieces in the, in the uh, collection. This experience at a young age, when you suddenly are faced with the fact or the experience that tells you what, what I'm different, you know, what, why am I different, you know? And, and it, it comes out in, in again, a uh, number of the monologues, um, this unfortunate, age story, you know, age old story, I guess, uh, that, uh, and again, it's just things that need to be uh, constantly uh, to brought forward and, and, and made aware of, you know, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people with my head in the ground, you know, <laughs> you know, but I don't know it. You know, I don't know I have my head in the ground. And, Unless I hear stories like this, unless I'm confronted with, you know, the people and the experiences that I've been able to engage with through this collection with Leland, it's just been, thank you. You know, it's, uh, it's what I need. It's what a lot of people need uh, to be engaged with uh, for us to get through this. So. First thing I'll say, uh, Donald, your head is not in the ground in the hole because 
you popped it out and you facilitated this anthology. Mm -hmm. that, that's one. Uh, uh, then, then, then I'll say to Diana that I, I love this kind of story of revenge, you know, because <laughs> you, you, you have this thing whereby the guy, one of the guys, the perpetrator, uh, all of a sudden, you, you know, he, he's feeling a little flavor there, you know, and he, he wants to take a couple sips from your straw. And he says, <laughs> well, no, thank you. Thank you, but no, thank you. Thank you. And the way that you left him completely befuddled. What? I'm all that and you told me no? <laughs> it's the yeah. best revenge. I mean, the best revenge is living well. And, you know, yeah. to have somebody, something that somebody ultimately is going to want that you can say, uh -uh. That's right. give him the buzzer. Yeah, give him the buzzer. I love it. And, you know, that reclamation of yourself that, you know, the turning of the tables, the flipping of the script to say that, yeah, I am worthy and you tried to deny me that and I'm showing you now through this vehicle, yes, I am not only worthy, I'm more worthy than you are, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it, it's a beautiful lesson for kids, man. So kudos, right. it's wonderful. It's reclaiming your, yeah, your worth. It's, it's great. Uh, and I love the humor. Uh, the humor that you bring to the piece is, uh, um, you know, there's, there's still the powerful story there, but uh, it's told with the humor, and uh, but it's still, you know, it's effective. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you allowing me to share it and to publish it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Welcome. Happy Juneteenth. Welcome. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to uh, J. E. Robinson. Uh, is uh, J.E. here with us still, hopefully. Oh, there he is. Hi, how you doing, Eric? I give uh, you permission to call me Eric, yes. Yeah, okay. Friends uh, call. All right. But since we're working together, you, uh, we're, we're, you, you know. have permission. Okay, great. Um, he, uh, Eric is uh, from uh, Alton, Illinois, uh, is an award-winning essayist and fiction writer, as well as a playwright. His work, Monologue for a Tutting Face, is an excerpt from his play, Groove. He teaches history at the University of Health and Sciences and Pharmacy in, in St. Louis. Um, so I'm taking, uh, are you, so are you in St. Louis? Are you in Illinois or? Illinois is a big state. The northern part of Illinois is about equal to about Hartford, Connecticut, the southern part of the state, which is further south than Richmond. All right, thanks. And, uh, St. <laughs> Louis is about is about the same latitude as Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Alton is 30 miles from St. Louis. We're where the river runs. You know the Mississippi? You heard of the Mississippi? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It runs, it runs uh, west to east at Alton. West of St. Louis. I've, I've ventured into that territory, but it's been a while. Well, um, you should. We have, well, no, this is the hometown of Miles Davis. Oh. I think yeah. that you like jazz. Oh, I do. I love jazz. If you like jazz, you must love Miles Davis. I love Miles Davis. I can Davis. take you to his birthplace if you wish. Kind of, kind of blue is, yeah. On my repeat uh, constant play. Yeah. So uh, tell us. Uh, monologue for a tutting face. What is that? Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm rather heartened that a number of pieces are uh, pieces from several years back because this piece is also from several years back. It's from 2011, 2012. And uh, as far as what might have inspired its composition, I, um, it was really an inspired moment. I don't recall exactly what caused me to write it, which is pretty good. Oh, it's oh, uh, Leland is silent. Leland is absolutely speechless for my piece. No, I, I was going to say that's okay because uh, 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 what's his name? Mm, I can't think of. His I name. mean, I'm I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by the people who are able to remember what they had, what why they had written something 15 years ago. I don't even remember what I had written last month. It's been busy. A <laughs> uh, guy wrote uh, into the mystic. What was his name? What's his name, Michelle? Oh, my wife's not here. Into the Mystic. He, somebody asked him 
well, what were you inspired by? What were you talking about when you wrote Into the Mist? He says, hell, I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm not supposed to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what are you asking me for? Yeah, honestly, I'm honestly I'm an old-fashioned creative writer. I think a piece is not complete until somebody reads it. And so it's the audience that will tell you, well, this is what it means. Uh, to be honest, the play that I'd written, that's based on, that's drawn from Groove, uh, is a play that actually sat for 10 years. I, I didn't send it out to anybody because I didn't think it was any good. I appreciate being invited to submit a piece uh, to this, uh, to, to this and, and I appreciate that the piece that I sent uh, found a home here because I, it, it, for me, it was just a play. And that's all, nothing more. Uh, uh, to, and whether it spoke to something, to some people, well, it, it was it, something an audience would have to tell me. Yeah, it, it's speaking, you know, it's about, you know, casting. Uh, for those that aren't read it, it's about casting. And uh, I love the, you know, Negro Mama 2 is the, is the character we're hearing from. And well, uh, don't you know Negro Mama 2? Norman Lear had Negro Mama 2 all over the place. Did he? Yeah, Dubois was Negro Mama too. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And what yeah. you know, she showed yeah. up. She always showed up. She jiggled her her butt onto the set long enough to uh to say something and go, mm -mm, Lord, Lord, and then jiggle her damn ass out. And and poor Esther Rowe was there saying, well, thank God she jiggled, because I sure wasn't going to do that. <laughs> Wingman, Esther Roll yeah. had dignity. Esther Roll had some dignity. I don't, I don't, I don't know the Negro Mama too had any dignity, because she showed up with that, with that, uh, with that um, polenta and gave it uh, something, and somebody ate it, and they didn't like it at all. Well, uh, August Wilson had no call for that, so he just had one Negro Mama. He didn't have Negro Mama too. <laughs> Oh gosh. And everybody yeah. knows you got to do uh, you got to do uh, August Wilson if you're going to act. Am I right? Yes. You be able to do August Wilson. Well, <laughs> August Wilson has need for brother one, brother five, brother fifteen, brother's mother, uh, brother's mother's uh, boyfriend. You know he has well call for all that. But how many times does he have Negro Mama too? He only he only uses one. He uses That's one. He uses one. <laughs> And they're all talking about doing that one. Yeah, you want to talk to somebody about doing a play? You want to talk about doing August Wilson? August Wilson is doing, he has all these, he has enough brothers on there for a football line. It's a funny <laughs> 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 whole team, yeah. I, I was almost reluctant to bring it up, but you know, you brought up Norman Lear and I, you know, it kind of reminds, it takes me back to the 70s, which I'm dating myself, and these sort of uh, the black sitcoms of the 70s. And, uh, oh my gosh, you know, talk about. I found, I found them infuriating until I, I found Norman Lear infuriating. We were not allowed to watch Norman Lear. Yeah. And then I realized that he, that tandem, Norman Lear's company also did Sanford and Son, which was actually good Chitlin Circuit humor. Yeah, very good Chitlin Circuit humor. Jefferson's and Good Times, we were not allowed to watch that. No, it, it, was, it was just pain, painful, you know, stereotyping of that. Uh, yeah. Painful stereotyping, but he was one of those good white people. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it was no, white people, you know. and, and this piece, really, you, know, kind of, you know, brings that whole, oh gosh, that whole uh, sad episode back. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, but, Supposed yeah. to play did some goods because it's, right. it's right. still sitting. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for joining us, Eric. Thank and uh, all the best there in Illinois, St. Louis. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, enjoy your evening. Thanks. Enjoy your too. Let's get to work. Let's not be finished with just being glad that they gave us a symbolo symbolic holiday. Let's get real uh, police reform done. Let's get this voting rights bill done. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, someone, someone said, you know, the, the arc of the moral universe, you know, is, is slowly bending towards justice. We need to break the damn thing. 
<laughs> just you know find the hinge right yeah right that's right so but joining us next is our Ar- rnc hall Corumbe, uh phd um and she is from philadelphia pennsylvania hi and, uh, hi how you doing Arnice? i'm well thank you uh, urgency. Uh, urgency. Thank you. Urgency. I knew I was going to get it wrong, but anyway. Uh, is, she's an associate professor of English theater arts in the Community College of Philadelphia. She co founded and leads Arden Blair Enterprises, a Philadelphia based entertainment company which houses several subsidiaries, including a semi professional theater company. She has worked as an educator, oh. workshop facilitator, actress, director, and designer for over 20 years. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, her piece is entitled The Last Days Where the Meek Inherit the Earth. Um, and one of the things I love about this piece is it's, you know, I think of it as a, a monologue with a soundscape back uh, where you have, you know, a person presenting the monologue, but then you also have these recorded uh, pieces that you've written, uh, which is just sort of provide the soundscape. Uh, so um, I think you might need to have somebody else mute. Um, it's Jack Jack. Okay, I'll uh, mute that. Okay, there we go. All right. So, um, hard and see. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, the, it came about through desperation. I was, uh, I wrote a play in 2016 called hashtag all lives don't matter um and after with the uh quarantine and then donald trump getting elected and the the things that were just going on uh we decided to bring the show back we thought it was an appropriate piece to bring back um and to do and to do the show again and so in working on the production, I realized I needed another piece and I needed a piece. I needed a piece for the men. I wanted something that was all men um, because the show felt very, uh, had a lot of female energy and I wanted it to have a little bit more balanced energy because this is something that even, you know, um, in this fight, we often see that it's African-American men who um, bear the brunt of the police brutality, but African-American women are going through it too. It's something that we're all suffering through as a community. And so I wanted the play to really have that balance. Um, And so I started writing this play and at the same time, I'm I'm originally from Texas and I was listening and uh, and I've been doing research for another piece and I've been looking at uh, the Sugarland 95, and I started listening to um, uh, music. Uh, I was listening to some Alan Lomax recordings, but also listening and recordings of uh, prisoners uh, singing uh, in jail. Uh, and so that rhythm started going through my head, and just this, and just the whole milieu at that time period of um, when we come out of this. I don't want to be in the same place. I didn't feel like we as a society should come back and go back and fall back into our old ways, that these were the last days that we were living through the last days. I was also reading some Octavia Butler at the time. So all of these things kind of mixed together to build this fugue. And it really is yeah. a fugue. I'm a, I'm, I'm a musician and yeah, at okay. heart. And so, uh, and I, and as a writer, we all know we often have many voices going through our heads at the same time. Mm-hmm. And all of these voices were trying to speak. Um, and so I was trying to give them space. And yeah. so this is the piece that came out. And the line, the, 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 the line that kept coming through was, you know, get your fucking knee off my neck. You know, that mm-hmm. line just, it, because that's what it was. Right. I, I think I had been in the house by that time at least three months. Mm-hmm. you know a couple of months at that point so it was <laughs> you know it was like and the and the pressure of writing something because something needed to be done and we were about to we were trying to put this in a show that we were trying to 
do virtually really fast and this everything was going really fast because it's right. we uh, as a theater company everybody was plunged into this virtual world very quickly and mm -hmm. and you had to figure out how were you going to do this right. and so um it was just all of those things put together yeah the piece definitely uh, has a very musical feel to it the uh, call and response almost kind of sense uh kind of feel mm -hmm. again these different uh, voices going on. Um, the one line that uh, struck me, um, there are a couple of lines here. You write, um, there was time when a picture spoke a thousand words. No more, that's done. It has manifested, run amok, splitting the time warp continuum, causing all kinds of junk to get in there and get stuck, stuck on me. Uh, it just, it says so much there, you know, how, you know, there was a time when. I, I mean, think about it. We, it. It was, we believed there was a time when a picture spoke a thousand words. Now people would sit there and watch a video right. and watch a video of people being killed mm -hmm. and, and, and right. still see, don't see it. I right. don't, I don't, I, he, he should have complied. They still don't see it. Don't we see sit it. there and Derek Chauvin, even though he knew he was being videotaped. Right. And even he didn't give a flying flip. Yeah. And when he and when and when he realized he was being videotaped, you see his eyebrow go up. And this is where you see the total lack of disconcernment for humanity mm -hmm. go through his whole spirit. You mm -hmm. saw it go across his face and he pushed down harder on the knee when he realized the camera was on him. He was like, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get off anyway. Right. I'll, I'll, it was a, it was, and a, everybody saw it, and I think that was a realization for everybody in the world. Everybody in the world was like, "Wait, well, I shouldn't say everybody because everybody didn't see it, but those of us who really truly saw it and heard it, mm -hmm. it was, it, it did something to jar our spirits. Right. It, it moved us. I, I, I think, I hope." in another direction so that we are not coming back as we come out of this pandemic in the same place that we were, that we're, that we have a different mindset in how we deal with this situation. Mm -hmm. So we'll see as we go forward. Yeah, no, I hear you. And it's, you know, even during the trial, you know, they're still trying to hit, obviously his defense team has to come up with some defense. Uh, mm -hmm. With just a straight face of, you know, oh no, you know, whatever. <laughs> right whatever you're gonna say. it's clear it's, it's right there but you know they divert us we get diverted that's another another line or another idea in the pieces we get so we're so easily diverted by various and sundry things like i was playing literally playing with my kitten at the time flashing a light on the wall and he was just jumping on the wall i said it don't take nothing yeah. And human beings have become the same. It doesn't take anything. We see it clearly. Right. But, oh, but look at that over there. Oh, and look at that over there. All the flashing lights distract us and, and move us away from the point from where we really should be looking. Yeah. So. But again, I, I think, as I said earlier, I think we're at a tipping point. Mm -hmm. Indeed. We'll see where things lead. I, you know, I'll just throw out, you know, I didn't really follow the Southern Baptist Convention uh, mm. that happened this past week. Yes. Uh, where they elected a moderate, you know, sensible uh, leader uh, over a sort of, you know, more ardent uh, right wing uh, Trumpian supremacist kind of person by only 500 and something votes. And that's what I, you know, in, in listening to that, I realized that's really the calculation of the, I have to say it, the Republican Party right now, mm -hmm. uh, is that if they can silence those 500 and some votes, then they can, you know, turn, turn it towards their, you know, so that's why, you know, it, it really is at a tipping point. Well, if, if that happens, it's, it's not going to be peaceful. No. I hope y'all ready for the fire next time <laughs> yeah. i'm just yeah. saying the meek shall hey. and the meek shall yeah. just because you meek don't mean you don't know how to defend yourself right. i'm just saying yeah. Yeah. 
one of the favorite lines I ever saw in a movie. Uh, I think it was uh, Robert Mitchum playing this cat that was like being bullied and he wouldn't fight anybody, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, the, the, the denouement was, the line was, I said I wouldn't fight. I didn't say I couldn't fight. And then he proceeded to whip ass. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Just the determination to go ahead and step up, step yeah. on and get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. You're Beautiful. a bad woman. You're a bad, bad, bad woman. I love yeah. this. Thank you. I love this piece. Yeah. Thank you. I love this piece. Yeah, I do too. And I, it's one of those, and I think it's one of the pieces that, uh, again, just because of the polyphony of voices, uh, I just love to hear it, you know, and hear it perform. And uh, hopefully sometime. I'll send you, actually, we, we recorded it because we did it as part of the larger piece as, oh. uh, and as a virtual piece. So uh-huh. I'll, I'll send you that recording so you That's can great. see it. No right. problem. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. See that. All right. Have a good night. Happy you too. Take care. All right, moving right along here. Uh, uh, Donald, yes. we skipped somebody. Did we skip? Who did we skip? Uh, Lewis. Yeah. Lewis Pardon me? Devon Nelson. We skipped did, Lewis John uh, Nelson. Did we skip Lewis? Yeah. We did skip Lewis. You're right. We did Lou, and then we had Lewis next, but we skipped Lewis and went right to, I think. Okay, I Lewis, are you still with us? He is. I'm, I am he, here. The oh, other Lewis. Yes, the other Lewis. The second Lewis <laughs> oh, yeah. is here. I mean, that's, yeah. Hello. I've right. been enjoying everything. And thank you, Leland and Donald, for having us on this platform to give thank our you. voices a platform. Um, I'm, thank you. I was so impressed with all of the work, and I'm really happy to be a part of this. So yeah, so Lewis, Lewis comes to us from Queens, New York, is a interdisciplinary artist and founder of Pokem Arts started in 2006. Uh, Nelson has worked for 20 years as a performer, choreographer, producer, and director for film, theater, dance, and more. His works have been shown on, in the USA, Europe, Australia, and South Korea. He has studied at DeSalle's University, Drexel University, the New School, the Jen Ruddy School of Dance, and I'm uh, sorry, the Jean Ruddy School of Dance, the Chorus School of Dance, and a proud member of the Dramatist Guild of America. Uh, Lewis's piece is Outer Inner Monologue, uh, which is also kind of a piece about uh, casting, uh, kind of reminds you the, the tutting uh, monologue a bit too. Uh, but this is about a person uh, at an audition. Uh, the, uh, it's sort of the outer inner monologue going on in that person's head. So yeah, tell us, tell us about uh, your piece. Well, I love writing and I love theater and, you know, I grew up looking for representation and the first memory I have is of Eddie Murphy on um, Saturday Night Live and like that kind of just being able to uh, develop characters uh, despite the appearance. and you know, I wanted to be an actor, and I started acting, and I started doing community theater, and then um, you know, the writing aspect was always write what you know, and that's different to every person. I try to always kind of hide behind my writing because I like very avant-garde work. Um, but this is the first piece that I actually wrote by invitation for a uh, fundraiser for a queer bookstore um, located at the center in Chelsea in New York. And I just kind of wrote something that I've been sitting on. We've talked about sitting on stuff for a long time um, and a couple of issues that came up with some of the other authors um, that resonated with me is like, you have these things that you write about that you kind of just draw from your experience and you kind of put into a dramatization, but this was, the first time that I've actually written something that was 95.9% autobiographical in nature. And it was um, a true experience of what happened to me when I was in college um, with some embellishments, but I went to college and I, I got to see what whitewashed was up close and personal for the first time. And I was working um, on becoming a, uh, 
a, a graduate of theater and the first thing I experienced when I auditioned for the fall musical was seeing a uh, Latina covered in white powder. And this is the story of um, what transpired with that. Yeah, interesting. You had a chance to, uh, again, uh, have your monologue performed on the virtual stream last fall as part of our uh, presentation. Uh, and I, again, it's, it's one of those humorous pieces, but again, uh, it hits you is to you know what is, you know, how, how does this person deal with the fact that um, he's auditioning and yet he's kind of almost, he's really seeing how they're seeing him. Is that in, in some regards? I mean, there's a sort of reverse, you know, how he's being perceived and maybe that's the outer inner monologue, you know, the, you know, what he's doing there. there yeah. Well, there um, a, a lot of it was just like, um, for me, just taking ownership of all of the roles that were available to me. Um, <laughs> Eric Robinson, I loved your bit when you were talking, everything that you talked about is very resonant with me because I'm very traditional kind of guy, like just let the work speak for itself. But for me, like being in an actor role, like there are specific things, like you gotta know your August Wilson or you're not gonna get work. And for me, like, I always like the last line of the monologue is I always wanted to be Harold Hill. And that was more of a joke because, you know, I grew up, like I said, with Eddie Murphy and like seeing his work in SNL, he was doing like all of these white roles, but as a black person and just kind of dodging that line that we have to cross over into or stand behind. And I was just trying to um, reconcile my own personal experience with always being like background dancer number one, drug dealer number two, like all of these things that we know will get us work and will get us money, but um, knowing that there's more to us. And a, a lot of people touch on a lot of the points of like these stereotypes that we have to overcome. And I think, you know, it's, com um, it's confounded by um, the queer aspect as well as like, you know, all of these like hyper masculine black male roles that I would have to audition for. How exhausting would that be for me to keep pursuing that or just to write my own stuff and, um, mm. and, and try to create roles that um, are a little bit more encompassing of our culture and who we are as a people or not just that one experience, like you said. Mm. So the thought but process I, of it, of, of, of the writing of it is, is more of like, um, it's just really trying to like use humor to get through tragedy, which is right, something I right. think that is really important to me and growing up, like it's always been like, you know, comedy is, uh, laughter is the best, best medicine for me. And so that's why um, it, it's at that point of view is a little bit more humorous, even though it really hits below the belt. I, I thought it was just amazing and incredible that the honor inner monologue, I mean, this is the things, these are the things that we might think to ourselves during the course of an audition that really kind of undermine us and maybe throw us off our game and we make a mistake or we go up and we're thinking these things, but they don't make it outside. They don't manifest in the air. And for you to use this internal monologue as your actual audition <laughs> and say, Scene and step back. You know? yeah. This is I'm showing you all of this. And and by the way, and you know, and and, and thank you very much. I'll wait for your call, you know. Because yeah. yeah. I'm showing it's, you that I'm much more than any of your even your imagination could come up with. It, it's yeah. also a kind of a fantasy because I think I mean in its first in Carnation, there were a lot of actors present and it was all playwrights presenting their own work and a lot of them was like, we've all been there. We've all just wanted to just kind of say what we're thinking and haven't been a lot of the opportunity to do that. So it was kind of a shout out to like actors who are in, you know, in, in the same page where like you, you've been in those auditions where you just kind of want to say like, this is this really it? Like, why am I here? But also I can't, imagine doing anything else theater is what I love so that was that was the point of contention for me is like making this very funny fantastical totally 
inconceivable thing happen um, for an actor to experience um, without it actually actually happening. <laughs> so that was, I mean, it's, it's a joke, it's sad, but it's funny and it's, it's, it's all over the place. And that was my, the Great. pith of it for me. Yeah. But it was so poignant and uh, the, the actor, the character is so vulnerable and it is just so, it's so devastating, you know, uh, with the icing of humor, you know, that little honey to make the pill go down. It's, it's just really devastating and, and on point. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's just I say, I love the ending line. Um, it's, it's one of those perfect endings that come out of nowhere, but it just kind of capstones the piece. You know? I always wanted to play. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be Harold Hill. I, you know. no. I mean, have we had a black Harold Hill? I, I don't think Hell I've seen. Oh no. Hell Would that no. ever happen? You Could you imagine well, it, if he took over a town with you bring up Harold and yeah, you bring up any music? Is that yeah. crazy? Hey, you bring well, look, up we, 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 and I, I think of him doing uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, you know, and what a black Mr. Rogers is, and, you know, what mm -hmm. yeah. Flipping the script. Well, we did have a at least a film. What it was, uh, Watchmen. They they were doing a black version of Oklahoma. So I guess anything is possible, right? Yep. yep. We got time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's make it happen. We got a long way to go. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad things are turning around and, and happening, but we got a long yeah. way to go. Yeah. So thank you again for having me for this. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Uh, Sorry to skip you, bro. Glad, glad we caught you. Just two Lewis's. You can't, can't just be one Lewis. I know. And of course, I put you right together. And I'm like, okay, so it's totally. It's all good. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Oh. All right. So next up, we have uh, Maurice Moore. Uh, hopefully, he's still with us. I think uh, Maurice, when he joined us, is uh, down in North Carolina. There he is. And uh, as things have gotten a little darker uh, since we first saw you, how are you doing? Yep. Mike? I'm doing well. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. So uh, normally from uh, Davis, California, which would be much lighter out there now, but uh, he's in North Carolina tonight. Uh, is currently a doctoral performance studies student at the University of California, Davis. He has exhibited and performed at the Medford Arts Center in Medford, New Jersey, the International House uh, Davis in Davis, California, the Memorial Union Gallery at North Dakota State University, Christina Ray Gallery in Soho, New York, uh, Weatherspoon Museum of Art in, uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and performed in uh, Rios Meralda in Madison, Wisconsin. So he's been journeyman all over. And uh, his piece is, uh, I think it's one of the pieces that, again, I, I love the titles, but I, I think this one hits me uh, the most is intriguing. Drawing While Black. Um, and uh, it's just a, a very, uh, I'd say curious piece. Uh, so uh, interested to hear your, uh, your inspiration behind it. Um, well, I mainly attended uh, PWIs as predominantly white institutions, and I did go. Uh, I think we're to HBCU, uh, but the majority of queer or uh, neurodiverse, um, the majority of people that I learned about in terms of the history have just been about dead white men, um, able bodied cis men. Um, the majority of people that I showed my work to until recently haven't been black or queer. Um, so I question, you know, what makes my art black? Uh, what makes my art queer? And then also teaching, um, I think the assumption will we make art, people say that it's for everybody, but that's not true because everybody doesn't speak English. Everybody doesn't have full uses of their eyes or their hands. So it got, it got me to thinking about about the different senses that I use to make my art. Um, you know, so like um, it's smart making them. What are differently able drawings or neurodiverse drawings? So it got me to question the different mark makings and things that I create and like what are black aesthetics to like really question that. Um, so that was kind of the, some of the inspirations for the piece. Great, yeah. Uh, hey, it's, a, it's an interesting question to, you know, kind of put, <sighs> ask you know what what how is this perceived you know i 
as a playwright myself, you know, I find, you know, it's always difficult to, to find how to put across the work so that um, without me in the room, <laughs> uh, how is this going to be perceived? Uh, and that's, you know, I think for every artist, you know, we have a hard time um, putting across our true intent um, in the work. Uh, but it sounds like, you know, you've taken it to an even more level of, you know, how is it, uh, what, what does it mean to be a person of, as you say, um, LGBTQ or um, uh, having uh, hearing or you know whatever uh, difficulties you're having uh, is, is another level of you know trying to uh, to address. Um, I'm curious how you how you see the piece being performed. Uh, do you have a, a sense of the the how? I tend it to blindfold myself and I listen to like different black music because um, I just think in the well, it's like in lots of communities, but black in, black communities called call and response. So you respond to the different things that you're listening to. So if you've ever been to church and the preacher says, can I get an amen? Uh, that's the call and response is the congregation clapping or saying amen. So it's kind of working those aesthetics that I grew up with in the South into um, my work and my piece, kind of figure out what black aesthetics are and what do they mean for someone like me growing up in the 21st century. Yeah, because the way you, you presented the piece and it's sort of you know, the way you laid it out on the page, uh, kind of um, so like you know yeah I mean it's like some of the links I have to go to to feel like what is it like to have black sight because the world tells me that my skin or my hair texture isn't beautiful so I have to see myself in a different way um, you know like my other senses through smell what is it like to smell a drawing that goes back for me like food studies and in the black community you know food way Oh, unfortunately, we're getting a little bit of a uh, loss of your that is the recipes that are passed down. down. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Sorry. Okay. But uh, no, uh, it's 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 a great a great piece, a great addition to the uh, to the uh, collection, um, which I you know I'm I'm glad that we've had so many sort of very interesting uh, creative uh, pieces like yours. Uh, and not just, uh, you know, definitely, um, I don't know, it, it just, it really feels a range uh, and uh, it just felt that your piece uh, needed to be part of the collection uh, to really uh, add that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, angle to it. So uh, thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, Leland, you have any? No, I, I really don't have anything to add, man. It's just a very unique perspective and uh, a presentation of your message. Uh, I, I love it. It's very unique. Uh, I, I, I really don't have anything else to add. Uh, I got to tell you, you were breaking up a little bit, so I, I lost a little bit of what you were saying. Uh, but uh, the piece does speak for itself, man. And you're a very worthy addition. And I thank you for showing up with the piece and showing up tonight. I know you guys are toward the end of the evening. And it's, yeah, it's, it's rough. Been waiting for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I apologize. Yeah, thanks for hanging in there, and uh, good luck Thank with you. the and in, uh, in uh, California. And uh, I'll wish you all the best. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So up next we have uh, Rajendra Ramon Maharaj. Uh, he's uh, from Brooklyn, New York, uh, a multidisciplinary American theater artist, administrator, and advocate. He was hailed as the New York Times for he was hailed in the New York Times for his award-winning play Little Rock, which was selected as a New York Times Critics Pick. He is currently uh, the associate artistic producer of Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Uh, which, uh, Rajendra, are you uh, still with us? I'm not sure if he's been able to hang out. Here we go. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so which brings me on. Are you in Milwaukee or are you in New York still? Uh, I'm actually in New York tonight, but I'm splitting my time between Milwaukee Rep and uh, Brooklyn. Okay. So uh, Regenda's piece is called Knock. 
simple uh, title, uh, and uh, is definitely a, a hard knocking piece uh, <laughs> knocking, uh, that uh, is uh, is we use it as sort of the the ending of the uh, the uh, collection uh, because I feel like it really just kind of adds that final note uh, to the uh, collection. And, and thank you for that. So yes, please tell us uh, where where this came from. Well, first of all, thank you. It's been such a fruitful evening, especially here on Juneteenth, to be with all these prolific writers sharing their stories and their words. So thank you for providing the space on this particular very important day in our history. Um, so before I went to Milwaukee Rep, I was elected uh, third vice president of the Brooklyn NAACP during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so Knock is um, an homage to my experiences in the streets of Brooklyn uh, as an activist, as an artist, uh, and bearing witness to the struggle that uh, has been a struggle since the first African uh, landed on these shores many, many moons ago. It's a rallying call, it's part testimonial, and it's also um, the thing that we as uh, BIPOC artists, and particularly brown and black artists and activists are constantly dealing with that knock at the door of America, the knock of the police batons against our bodies, the knock of uh, hope that sits at the very core of who we are as people, as Americans, as citizens. So that's where the piece came from. And I'm really proud to have it close out uh, the anthology and um, to um, have such a, um, the piece has really touched a lot of people. And so it's really nice as an artist to see work that's speaking to the now, that's actually kind of affecting the kind of soul and the souls of America. So um, that's a little bit about it. Great, thank you. Um, one of the lines that uh, struck me, which uh, I had to put on the, uh, the back cover as well, uh, is your, the line right at the top of the piece. Our story, my story, this story begins with a hemlock growing out of the very soul of America. And it kind of speaks to um, how things have, you know, really started and sort of rotten at the core um, with, you know, having this, in fact, one of the pieces that in the collection, uh, author is, you know, join us tonight, uh, talks about an African-American who is a, uh, I guess, a slave to Thomas Jefferson and seeing him write the lines, uh, all men are created equal and thinking, all right, they get it. All right, this is going to be good. You know, we're going to have our own country and everyone's going to be equal. And then as he's walking in, you know, he's like looking at the slave, like, you know, why are you walking next to me? You know, why aren't you up behind, you know? And then the slave realizing that, oh, when you mean everyone's equal. You, know, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't mean uh, uh, when all, all, all men are created equal. You didn't mean black uh, or black people. No, we, and particularly with Thomas Jefferson, you know, we know that he owned Sally Hemings and raped her and had kids. And so oh. the fact that, you know, this is a, a tale that is uh, continuing to unfold every day in our, our country and our history, the idea of white male fragility um, and how our art hopefully can be a hammer and chisel to some of that. Um, and at the same time, as Amir Baraka says, be lighthouses for the next generation of artists and activists um, in the American theater. Yeah, definitely. I mean, today celebrates, you know, the Juneteenth, the, uh, the quote, end of slavery, uh, and you know, getting a little closer to that, you know, ideal of all men are created equal. Um, but, you know, it, it's still not there. Uh, yeah, the struggle is very real. I mean, we, you know, it's so funny. People often say, um, you know, Trump was one of the worst things for America. And in many ways uh, he was, but there was also, it was in the, the marrow of this country, you know, from when the first pilgrim took uh, 
a Sioux or a Mohawk's land, um, and then of course slavery. But I, I am encouraged because of spaces like this tonight. Um, I am encouraged as a BIPOC leader in the American theater who is in the room where it happens, as they say, um, and that you're able to provide the space for us and have these conversations. You know, yes, we are warriors, but we are warriors with many allies, and that's how the, the fight is won. So I, I choose to use my pen as my sword, and um, I'm just really excited to be here and be able to share this space with everyone. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, kudos on the piece and, uh, and your work, and uh, look forward to uh, hearing more about what uh, you're, you're up to. Uh, anything happening at uh, in uh, Milwaukee or yeah, yeah we coming more alive? Yeah, we're, we just, uh, we're coming back with our season. Um, I was really fortunate this year uh, to be a finalist for the Eugene O'Neill um, with my work mm -hmm. and thank you. And um, I think this is a really important time right now for BIPOC artists to use the, the, the stage as a lightning rod for social change. And so I hope that we continue when it goes out of fashion to continue to make it fashionable to tell the truth and speak yeah. truth to power. Say, so, you know, it continue. Yeah, you just keep that bullhorn going too, brother. Yeah. Yes, yes. I love yeah, that. Yeah, we, we have, yeah, we have to keep our eyes on the prize and we have to, you know, one of my heroes, James Baldwin, says, you know, that uh, being an artist and being an artist of color, you have two choices. You can either be conscious or not. And I choose to be conscious. Right. And, and stay there. Stay awake. Oh, don't, 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 don't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> stay conscious. Stay conscious. <laughs> yeah. uh, your voice is very much appreciated, bro. And uh, I, I love the fact that you got a bullhorn and you're slinging it around like a gunslinger. And you ain't afraid. And um, we need you. And thank, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I, one of the things that Amir Baraka said to me before he passed, which I'll, I'll share with everyone, he says, I'm not afraid of any black or brown person. I love my people. And so I just think that in a way, all of these beautiful pieces, starting with yours and ending with mine, is really a valentine to us loving ourselves and loving the diversity of thought, of mind, of body. Um, and lifting up our ancestors who could not even imagine that a space like this could exist or a book like this could exist. So we honor them and we honor those yet unborn. And I thank you both in this June team. That's oh, okay. man, so eloquent. Thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, I think, uh, let's see. What do we have? Well, Donna, we've got two folk here. I think, yeah, we have uh, Sharon. Sharon and, and Crystal. Crystal. They're both. Yeah. Um, and why don't we just bring you guys out and uh, we'll wrap up here tonight. Um, hi, Sharon. How you doing? Sharon's from uh, Los Angeles, California. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, this has been absolutely incredible just to hear all of the wonderful words and um, the voices that are sharing on this platform is, um, it's been incredible. And I'm just very honored to be a part of uh, uh, the event tonight and the anthology. So thank you so much, Donald and Leland. And of course, happy Juneteenth to everyone. Um, and thank you. Yeah, this has been wonderful. Anything you want to share about your piece that uh, you can... Yeah, well, you sort of highlighted it a bit. Um, it's the signing and it does, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it does, um, you know, sort of give a fictitious um, a, a situation of, of Robert Hemming, Sally Hemming's older brother, um, who was the attendant to Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, imagined uh, and he was it said that he uh, accompanied him to Philadelphia. And so when they were signing, you know, the Declaration of Independence that I imagined, well, what would it, what would happen if he saw that, if he read that 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 beautiful piece of work and 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 thought of himself as included in it mm -hmm. and and then realized it, it wasn't a, it wasn't for him right 
yet, yet it was, right? right? Yeah. Because that is the foundation of what everyone fights for is equality, justice, liberty, you know, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what we all want. And so that was, that's what all of our civil rights, you know, advocates lean on. Mm -hmm. And so even though those, those, you know, four figures, um, the founding figures wrote this beautiful, well, you know, Thomas Jefferson created it, but they signed this beautiful piece of work that really is all inclusive, but their mindset was not inclusive yet. The document is. Yes, right. And so eventually we will all receive the benefits of what that document stands for. Yeah. Right. We're, st we're still waiting to, uh, to realize it's, it's, uh, it's true potential. It's true potential. Yeah. 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 I think, I think the first step is, uh, I think we may be slowly achieving it is the realization that when that document was uh, construed and, and written and set down, the fact of the matter was that uh, the only men were white men because black folk weren't men. Uh, at best, we could be three fifths of a human being, but even then that was not, they weren't talking about us, it wasn't meant for us. And that's what's so beautiful about the scene of instruction as I write in my piece that the man in your, your piece uh, 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 came up against the realization that yes, all men are created equal as long as they are all men. And now I realize my scene of instruction is I am not, con I am not seen as a man, as a human being. And what that does to a man's psyche, what that does to a man, what it does to him, that's a very interesting discussion. And mm -hmm. thank you for shedding light on that moment, that, that scene of instruction, which, you know, so many of us have, you know, in this call tonight, delineated in one form or another, the moment when, uh, oh, <laughs> I get it now. Mm -hmm. I see it now. It's important. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Is uh, uh, Crystal, Mayo, are you uh, able to... Join us there, she, there. Crystal. Hello. Hey, how are you? Doing? <laughs> so, Thank you so much for having me, Leland and Donald. Happy yeah, Juneteenth. Uh, coming from uh, Stanford, Connecticut. I'm originally from the Bronx, New York City, but Stanford, Connecticut is my home now. Yep. Oh, you know, Bronx. Yes, 152nd Street, <laughs> 205. That's me. I'm kind of straddling between. Uh, I guess cl probably closer to New York than New Hampshire, but uh, <laughs> you know, a little in between. Got it, got it. But uh, so tell us uh, a bit about your piece. And, and well, we can... my piece, Mother to Son, it was um, directly inspired by George Floyd. Uh, it was just, why I know many people have spoken about it, just watching that video was an experience that I had never experienced before and I just needed an outlet for it. Um, I also had have a son who was 16 at the time and I immediately thought, oh my goodness, like I have a son. This could be my son. This is what I'm thinking in my head. So I remember when I was younger, I used to love the Langston Hughes poem about mother to son and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I, I have to write something for everyone, but really for my son. And it was at the point where we went to the Black Lives Matter um, protest. And I heard so much about people saying like, oh, is Black Lives Matter? Why is it Black Lives Matter? And what kind of people would, would march during a Black Lives Matter. And I just thought, wait a minute, let me just as a, as a poet, as a writer, break down those words like Black Lives Matter. And I realized, and it's something that I already knew that it's so much history behind those three words. Um, and that history has a lot to do with ancestral trauma. And in writing, I really started to explore like the timeline of that from the beginning of slavery to 
women who had um, African slaves who had to be the wet nurses for white babies and then like negate their own children from building from swamps a railroad, but yet you can't ride on the train or you have to go on the in the colored section or building the White House, but yet you still deny to vote. And just those words alone are just words that have been spoken and felt for many years. <laughs> um, and I just really, I guess, wanted to just share that timeline and have something for especially my son so he can realize that, yeah, Black lives have always mattered and um, we have been relevant and, and Black lives have been the fabric of America. Yeah. So that's really what birthed the piece. Mm -hmm. um, just exploring those words and, and the weight of it. Um, and just wanting my son to understand that he, he, he does matter. Although there are uh, people in America who feel that he don't or the system does not treat him as someone who does matter. He is relevant. And uh, it's really an, an affirmation that has been passed down to us for many years. Yeah. It's sad that, you know, I'm afraid for too many, they hear Black Lives Matter as a threat. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I hear it. And, I, and that's what I wanted to explore. It's like, yeah. you know, it's Black not. Lives have always mattered. But let's go right. back. Let's go back to the timeline here, you know, and then you just explore the, the, the injustices, but how yeah. over so much time we still were alive, we still prospered, we still kept going. So it's just so much mm -hmm. ancestral trauma, but yet triumph and history behind those words. They just didn't pop up and, you right. know, end up on a t-shirt. Like there are meaning, there's a meaning, a valid meaning behind those words. And, and yeah. everything else, and, you know, for me, I see that, you know, every time I see it, it just reminds me, oh, yeah, we got a problem here. Um, you know, it's just an, enough of an, you know, you know, click and, you know, like, yeah, we still got a problem here, you know, um, and we got to deal with it. So, yeah. I, right. It's, it's, it's important also, and, and, and this, is, this is the power of your piece and the power of the, the piece of rain um, that the reiteration that uh, historic history, the, the strength, the, the, the perseverance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the journey is not over, but, you know, broken, but unbowed, you know, bloody, but unbowed. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, we have the strength and, and, and the, 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 the example from everyone who's come before and that has bled, that has sweat, you know, and whether they give us good credit whether or not, we can take it upon ourselves to know that not only is this our country, I mean, uh, because we made it, mm -hmm. we built this, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like when we know that and mm -hmm. own that, I often say to young people, nobody can take anything away from you unless you open your hand and let them. Mm -hmm. You know, once we grasp the reality of our history and, and the full knowledge of who we are, were, and possibly can be, the only way we can lose that is if we let somebody else take it away from us. And for you, like Tanahisi, given his son, your son, the advice and the legacy that he is blessed with, and you know, maybe tasked with carrying forward you know, soldier-like, you know, this is important stuff, man. This is stuff that we need to pass on. And it's our responsibility as writers and artists, and me, me artists and now activists to continue to shed the light and, you know, reiterate these words and ideas. And which is what this whole friggin' thing is all about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, recalibration of the narrative to take control of our own narrative to be in control of where we go from here instead of being knee jerked around <laughs> by folk who want us to jump through the hoops and run through this avenue so they can continue to maintain control. 
is, is the beauty of this event, is, is the beauty of this ethos, your work and the rest of these artists. I mean, I'm, I'm over the frigging moon <laughs> behind this whole frigging thing. I mean, I've been in the city since 84 and I've never seen anything like this. And, you know, with all the things that are happening, I've known a couple of a number of folks who are curating this and curating that. I am proud to be a part of this curated event and, and book. Uh, I'm probably going to spend too much money sending this damn thing around to people, but yeah. it's, it's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm probably the reason why we so over, over time. I talk too damn much. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I should have, can't, you know, figured we've got like, probably closer to 10, you know, this is, it, it's been great. You know, I, you know, I just said over the moon as far as, uh, you know, just being able to have these discussions and talk and, and get to meet all these great people. Uh, and I think uh, Crystal is our last, uh, did, I for, did we forget anybody out there? Talk, jump out if you <laughs> if we forgot you, hopefully we didn't overlook I don't anybody. think we forgot anybody live. We didn't read a couple of statements, okay. but. Well, yeah, there's a few statements, yeah, to finish reading. Uh, but before we get to those, I just like everyone again, turn on your cameras and uh, say hi. Uh, shout outs to anybody you want to. Uh, so yeah, jump in here and uh, you know, if you want to talk to anybody, you know, I, I felt like, you know, if we were holding this event, you know, in some sort of function hall or something, you'd all, you know, get together in corners and share stories with each other and stuff. But unfortunately, we don't have that opportunity here. So, so again, you know, shout out to anybody you want to. Uh, thank, and thank you all for, for hanging out here for, uh, for this whole uh, evening. Um, it's been, again, great. <laughs> great talking with everybody. All right. So I guess, uh, let's see. Anybody We've got uh, Christian St. Croix's statement. Yeah. And we've got... Um, I think Zachary. Zachary as his statement, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, so let's see. And I want to finish with Zachary. Uh, so we'll go Let to. Let me take Christian. Let me do Christian and. You why don't you do Christian? Zachary. All right. Why don't you do Christian and, uh, and I'll do Zachary. All right. Christian St. Croix, follow the fireflies from San Diego, California. In his bio, he identifies as he, him, his. He's a playwright theater maker and author of M, a collection of prose, poetry, and microfiction and outward, outward magazine described as raw, real, radical, racy. Mm. His play, Monsters of the American Cinema, was performed in new, at the new 2019 San Diego International Fringe Festival and was described as touching and funny, honest and engaging by the San Diego Union Tribune. Statement. With Follow the Fireflies, I wanted to remember those who have lost their lives to racial violence, specifically to remember that they didn't sign up for any causes or to be the faces of any movement. Life is a short word, but we all know the many, many things that can come with one. These beautiful people didn't want to be martyrs or hashtags or inspiration for empowering art. They had a favorite color and a favorite food. They had a song they loved. Thoughts that made them laugh out loud when they were by themselves, memories from childhood, ring and shoe sizes, the way they were liked, the way they liked to wear their hair. They had things they wanted to do and be. They didn't want to die. Through the monologue, I wanted to create a place for these souls and audiences to reflect on the lives they left behind before reaching the peace they deserve. I hope I achieved that. A special thanks to Leland Gant, Donald Tung, New World Theater, and to all of you beautiful writers. Have a blessed Juneteenth. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, I know Christian wanted to uh, to be with us, but couldn't get off work. Uh, he sent me an email. But uh, yeah, thank you, Christian. Happy Juneteenth thank to you as well. Uh, and let's see. Yes, our last statement is from Zachary. Ezra uh, from Austin, Texas. Uh, Zachary uh, is bio, he's a playwright and dramaturge who animates theatrical countries through dramaturgical forms. He has an MFA in playwriting, 
He is an MFA playwriting candidate at the University of Texas at Austin, a UT Missioner Fellow for the class of 2023, a 2020 Town Stages Sokoloff Creative Arts Fellow, a 2018 UFU Ear Dream, uh, sorry, I Dream uh, resident, a 2015 Wesleyan University Olin Fellow, and a member of the Tanks Lit Council. Uh, Zachary's piece is entitled Epicenter. Um, and one of the, the lines that I love from it uh, that I kind of picked out here, um, he writes, exactly, exactly, because I would never say it around you. That's not how this friendship works. I can see immediately how uncomfortable it makes you. I keep the part of me that's black far away from you guys. I know you're not interested. And Zachary's statement is, I am thrilled to be included in this volume with such a wide variety of talented black playwrights and that my piece is a dist distillation of what it's like to be the only black person in a situation. Just what you have, just what you have to swallow and what happens when you can't swallow anymore. It has been wonderful working with New World Theater, and I'm very proud of the book staring at me on the bookshelf right now. Warmest regards, ZE. I just have to say that, yes, uh, having a physical book staring at you, uh, not a virtual thing, uh, is a beautiful thing. Uh, and I hope uh, lots of people will take a chance to, to get a copy, uh, support these wonderful authors, and uh, again, support uh, some uh, truly um, good causes that uh, we will be uh, donating to in the future. And we'll be letting you know what those are. Uh, Leland, thank you and everyone for, uh, for being here this evening. Uh, it has been a true pleasure uh, to spend this Juneteenth uh, with all of you. Karen, yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, you and thank you guys for sharing your time with us and your stories, and your passion, and your work. I mean, uh, I, I love this. this. Uh, my wife is going to hit me upside the head because I'm an hour overdue, but I wouldn't want to spend the time any other way. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, God damn, thank you. <laughs> Whew, Lord have mercy. Yeah, it's good, good for the soul. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All right. Well, onward. And uh, we will see you all soon, hopefully. And uh, yep. okay. down the Thank road. Yeah. Peace. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. And good night.